This is going to be episode 88 of Summoning Insight. I'm not the one controlling the stream, by the way, so I'm not, I, I don't have anything synced up here. I'm just relying on, on faith that someone in America in esports will execute this problem. So much like Riot Games in many ways, every single time Worlds comes around. So did I succeed? Did I fail? Not on my head, is it? Not my fault. So anyway, the episode has begun. You probably thought this was the end of Summoning Insight. I did too, but then it turns out, more money available, so we're back. So <laughs> we're not. There's one more episode because this is the thing. AT and T and Cloud Nine. Exactly. Yes. Oh yeah. So this is the the. Oh, yeah, I forgot. It's supposed to actually be the Nines version. So the Nines summoning insight presented by AT and T. Thanks, powered by Cloud Nine, etc. So even though this one's not in the studio in LA, it would have been weird to just go and do all those episodes, especially if we did so many in the group stage, and then just be like, "Here's what I predict for the final. Here's what I predict." Really? Well, we'll see who's right. Maybe we never will. And then you should, then should never, ever do another episode until next year. I mean, but so it, we have to do one to wrap up what happened in the final, right? So what we thought was, since we had such a jovial time, we were all just getting along so well, in many ways, it was the best of times. It's almost like if you just pay people enough money and put them really close to each other, they'll have to be vaguely <laughs> civil to each other, as oh, opposed really? to before when they're thousands of miles away and they can just hit that little leave call button at the end and then never worry about the other guy crying himself to sleep because you're a bit too mean. Don't, I wasn't thinking of anyone specifically when I said that. I'm just saying for any of us, you know, generally, that's a problem I think we all have. I'm genuinely sorry if I ever made you cry to sleep at night that was never my intention <laughs> yeah well to be fair you will make me cry today if i see you for one second look down to your right and laugh when you're not controlling a stream you're not producing a show there's no reason you never need to look at that twitch chat you would never need for, you would never need to source from that twitch chat your opinions your ideas or any sort of an emotional response to me and what i've yeah. said all you need to do, son, is just look at that screen. Look at me. Mm -hmm. Pretend that I'm your fucking grandma I moved to Australia and you're trying to connect with me and still have a meaningful relationship because this is the only way this is going to work. So anyway, our guest for this one, because we were having such a jovial time, is obviously LS because I know I've learned a long, long time ago that like when you're making up a stew, you know, yeah, you need your meat and potatoes. You need the basic stuff in there, you know. Then you start chucking in a little bit of stuff. Eventually at the end, though, maybe you just want a bit of spice or a bit of flip. Put the motherfucker in there. Just chuck some of that, and then you go. Oh, is it, oh wait a minute, is Aunt Jemima capable of handling a bit? So who gives a fuck? Put another fucking chili in there, and then you know that the right people are the ones consuming that gumbo at the end, the mean gumbo that we do on here on Summoning Insights. So, because we didn't have enough spice already. No, no, we Always didn't. Use a little bit well, more. we don't actually now. Because here's the sad thing. Let's be real. There's one elephant in the room on this show that we've never addressed, which is what? the old show we used to do. Local used to actually like battle us, whereas now he's just like some sort you. of like he's so <laughs> run do down that. and beaten that he's like he's just hoping like I disagree with you all stuff. the time. You just yell over me. So I disagree with you you're yelling. <laughs> Yeah, it's brilliant, um, isn't it? So yeah, <laughs> Twitch chat's important for me. What if I run out of things to say? I can just say whatever's on Twitch chat. It's the way he actually says that line out loud, <laughs> hoping people will take it as comedy. When everyone listening just goes, "Yes, you, you literally do that." You know, we are fully aware. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, let's get this motherfucker on the road. So I think like, it's pretty obvious on this episode, we don't need like a million signposts. I mean, all we do is talk about the final. We can talk about some other things in the tournament afterwards. But why don't we just start there? Like, there's no point that beating around the bush. Also, so people LS, are saying Loco is low, but that's because Loco is sitting really far away from his microphone. He's just, he's... To, to be fair, I usually put his, I put his volume up quite a lot. Because remember when he does, the, there's a, a detail to add, which is when he does the stream, he uses a different mic or some bullshit. So no, 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 I use this mic. I'm using this mic. Turn it, turn it up a little bit. I'm turning him up. I'm turning him up. Okay. But Monty can do it anyway. Uh, uh, so, so Monty, anyway. my box is a little fucked. Can you move my box up slightly up so it's filling up the overlay? No. Please. <laughs> Just expand your head a little bit more to meet hours roughly. This. Anyway, the pot, here's, what, here's what we're going to start, right? Which is, amazingly, Loco and Papa Smith, you were correct on the predictions, FPX won. But the one thing I think we have to start the whole episode with is... I don't think anyone who shadow boxed that final or was doing a preview thought that was actually the final that was going to happen. Like, even the people picking FPX were like, it'll be a great series. Or, in fact, I heard a lot of people, the only reason they weren't going 3 2 was because there hadn't been a 3 2 series and every single series was 3 1. Like, that was, aside from that, almost everyone thought it was going to be a banger series. I thought, actually, despite all the past worlds. So, LS, I, I actually don't know what your prediction was. I'm guessing you picked 3 2 once the actual final came, right? 
Uh, no, uh, on on the stream. I mean, Nemesis even joked maybe I would get a prediction right, but I, I oh, said right. that I thought okay. I thought the drafts would heavily impact the series, and I, I said during the stream I thought FPX would actually win. Okay, mm-hmm. right, let's start there then. So when you say that, I noticed this. I obviously this is a, a predilection of yours is the draft and how uh, whether or not it's that essential. Yeah. And I think actually, like just to get a, a taste for this year, do you actually find that this year's drafts are more impactful than previous years? If you go back to the years when Korea dominated, was it a bit more straightforward for you? Yeah, I, I talked about this all year uh, since I originally came back to casting. I think that because the be, because the overall level of the game globally improved as much as it did. Um, the build order phases of the game are more commonly understood, and what is needed to punish certain mistakes inside of laning phase or even early mid transitions or whatnot requires team play to be at a higher level. And so, if stuff's not happening and drafts are the certain way, you can get out of the build order phase. And so, scaling team compositions have been harping on it all year long. Eventually, come online, and they reach that stage. And so. The drafts, I think, were really, really important in Worlds. I, I thought that they were very lackluster, though, in terms of the champion priority that we saw almost all throughout the tournament. I mean, some stuff died pretty, pretty early on, like Echo uh, passed away really quickly. Um, but even if you look at plans, the, the scaling team compositions always tended to win G2 versus SKT. The scaling team comps tended to win FPX versus... I mean. Scaling was something I, I, I harped on about all year long. And I remember getting into arguments, I think even with Loco on Twitter uh, mm-hmm. about it. Um, I, I always said scaling was better. Um, and I, I held that for a long time under the premise that once teams got better, once they understood certain timings and all this other stuff, you get to guaranteed phases of the game. Turret plating is overvalued because when you go through all of the games, the mass majority of games, there's not a gross imbalance in terms of the gold gained. The way that dragons are, uh, mountain dragons obviously are really nice if you're ahead. If you're behind, it's a non-factor. Infernal dragon, I think, is grossly misunderstood. Um, anyway, stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Right, right, let's yeah. Uh, let's actually start with the draft for this series then, because I, I well, we, we like, have to start. Not only the, was it, yeah, we have to start with the Kiana stuff because that was something that we talked about a lot on the last episode, sure. and whether we were going to be able to see uh, G two actually play the kiana because it's so important and especially i think in this matchup with how well we've seen uh fun plus phoenix actually especially tn but they can also flex that pick over and that was something that they looked really uncomfortable on previously and indeed all we saw was kiana bands coming in which showed uh, showed me at least that they were really not prepared to actually run one of the most important picks uh at the in this whole tournament which I thought was very weird. Yeah, I mean, if you're banning Kiana on red side and also banning it on blue side, then that shows like you're not willing to play it. And that was like a huge point Papa Smithy made that G2 would pick up Kiana within the week. They're in Europe. They can scrim teams that they need to be. And it's a really important pick, probably the second most OP pick after Pantheon that they need to pick up. And they weren't able to pick it up. So that hurt their draft. Like the, I'm amazed I mean, they the never draft. played it though, because like here's the thing. I know obviously, like in theory, it would be jungle you'd put out right now. They did play it. They just Perks, played it badly. I thought um Caps when he played it mid lane in the summer in LEC was good on it. Actually, he looked like like everyone. He looked like if you just did the ult, you fucking win the game on it. Like I know what the problem would be. You would think in a team as diverse as theirs, a champion as strong as that would have some home, like one role surely. So the thing about Kiana is she actually does really have an incredibly weak level one and two. Like her one and two is one of the worst in the game because she's not like she at level one. Um, how her Q and W functions, you need both skills for it to function properly, right? The Q is like her little attack thing, and if you need to get an element with W, if you don't have either skill, if you don't have both skill, you're not able to use it properly. So in early level, she's extremely weak. So her primary role has been jungle a lot of the times, and Yanko's just is not a good Kiana player. So yeah, I mean. Yankos played Kiana in groups, and then they banned it versus Dom one, and then they banned it versus SKT, or SKT banned it versus them, and even when SKT opened it, they never really picked it, so they just showed an ability to play Kiana. What else in the draft? Uh, like, obviously, we're going to go specifically into, like, player performances, etc. So, like, for example, would you consider it a... A mistake to keep pushing Yankos onto Elise. I know that's like classically a champion he obviously plays, just because he actually didn't play very well in the final. Like, were, were the jungle picks a problem on the G2 side? Does it matter? So they can make it better. 
by taking Rek'Sai into it. That's a really common matchup into Lee Sin, Rek'Sai. But they overall, as a team, decided they're going to push the jungle pick as long as they're not getting pinched. So every single um, draft, they took double bot lane, AD carry support, and a solo laner for their first three. So maybe there's a difference if they take Rek'Sai, but I think overall... Well, Rek'Sai was banned all three games. But it was always yeah, no, banned have... in the second round of the draft because yeah. they weren't prioritizing the Elise pick. Elise was always coming in later mm -hmm. on in the draft, or the Jarvan in the case of the last game. So their first round, um, first round of the draft, Elise already always getting picked by FPX, and G2 has the opportunity to counter it, but they chose not to counter it, and they let it go to 4 and 5, and they let it get banned out. So it was an active choice to not take it and prioritize other things. But I don't even think like them the jungle matchup mattered that much. It is Tian looks amazing. Because Doing B allows Tian to look amazing, and Doing B provides so much for Tian to be amazing. So maybe jungle could have mattered, but the way the games are going, I don't think it would have been a big deal if they took Rek'Sai early. I don't think it changes the overall picture. Right? Is there a world? Like, it's open to anyone, but obviously, unless this would be an interesting topic for you to weigh on. on right? Based like one of the things I try to do in CS:GO, like so, like a very, very brief history lesson for everyone here is that in CS:GO we also have a pick and ban phase, but it's for the map that you play on. So instead of the changing the character, you change the terrain you play on, which can obviously similarly have an incredible impact on the game. And the problem was in our game. Like in, in a CS GO LAN, you know, we don't have like Dota where it's a 20 minute pick ban phase. Like the phase where you pick the maps is maybe like 30 seconds long. Let's say a minute yeah. tops, right? And usually it's only a minute tops if it's an event that I've asked purposely to slow down the order so I have time to talk about it. Otherwise, they just put it on screen and you discuss it, right? And the problem was, People actually in CS used to treat this like fans as though it was like not that big a deal, even though it's not as big a deal as like MOBA games, but it's still a fairly big deal. So one of the things I purposely do when I try to break down the pick ban phase is because obviously it's not just like data on its own, like it's data about players that I know and have followed a long time. I often try to like see if I can use some of it to make a get a guess at what their like mind state might be going into the game. So for example, if someone in the pick part in CSGO doesn't pick their strongest map, but only goes into like an area that isn't a strong map for them but isn't a strong map for the opponent i would probably surmise depending on the team something like they're trying to gamble they know they're not the favorite actually and so they're purposely going into a map that both aren't as good on to increase the variance and hope they can get an upset one whereas like i would normally take it it's just obviously painting with very broad strokes if someone was the favorite in a matchup they would pick their best map probably regardless of the opponent you know and oftentimes even if the opponent's good on it the logic is well i'll win on it if we both play it right Along those lines, do you actually get the sense from this draft? Because this is something I certainly wondered about when I saw this final play out. Like, G2 actually came in thinking that they were the underdogs. Everyone else spun it that they thought they were the favorites and that they didn't understand what happened and stuff. Do you think the drafts suggest that they, they, they knew they were weaker than FPX LS? I, I think, uh, well, I, I, I don't know how I would view it. Because against SKT, they drafted pure uh, mid-game scaling um like pure mid late game um L throughout lac all summer uh, veteran made some sort of a tweet that I, I i tweeted about on on twitter that i said didn't make any sense um when you look at their lac summer drafts they have a lot of early and mid game focused team compositions and in game one they have just that they have an early and mid game focused team composition that falls off a cliff uh in the mid to late transition and late in game number two they have a a completely off theme Yasuo, Akali, Tristana, Elise, Gragas team composition that basically it has to get ahead and then you you wonder how and then in game number three they finally went back to scaling and then randomly at 25 minutes in game timer I think it was yeah, 25 10 or something uh FPX has a baron they randomly decide to take a team fight inside the red side jungle they end up losing a lot and then again at 29 minutes um they're just randomly in awful spots, even though the team comp, which was scaling, better favored them. I think by game three, they probably think that something's going wrong. Maybe they go back to scaling. But game one and two, I think, is on par with maybe how they felt inside of uh, LEC Summer, where they're choosing early game strong power champions. I think that they probably thought they were more outmatched by SKT than by FPX in game one and two. Okay. What well, did you think of this one I mean, I I think I thought this draft was just like incredibly strange overall. So I guess what what didn't necessarily surprise me 
Uh, well, what surprised me was like the the Zaya ban, especially in game one, coming out of G two, trying to avoid the Zaya first pick from FPX. Even though I think that's been Perks's strongest champion throughout the entirety of World so far. Um, and it looked like they were trying to fo force a situation where LWX would be uncomfortable, so the Kai'Sa and Zaya bans came through. Now, of course, with FPX going Syndra Gragas, that's not too surprising. The Gragas is there. I think it's actually a better ban than the Yasuo because the Gragas is the flex pick that you can run out of the jungle, whereas, and it's it's oftentimes, I think, necessary if you're going to run Yasuo in the bot lane to set mm -hmm. up the Yasuo. So I think by banning Gragas, like, you take away a jungle champ and you sort of and take away the Yasuo before, yeah. in the bot lane, which I think is really smart of FPX. Um, and I have to say, like, I, I touched on this in the IG series, but I think FPX's bans are, have been really interesting because they target specific players while still opening up their strategies. And one thing that Papa Smithy said last show, which was, I think, correct, is that FPX was just going to play their style. And that's what they did against IG. And that's what they did here. But they also had, a, they targeted the Shy very heavily in the last series. Whereas here, I think they were really targeting perks in a lot of ways um g2 has to ban the kiana they don't want it going first pick but the zaya is a little weird um especially because the fpx goes ahead and first picks nautilus so they want to use that as a flex pick they don't show much by taking lee sin and sivir um but it, it makes g2's comp really weird because of course they have to take the sivir after the varus is taken so they take the varus tom kench the very like safe more defensive style of lane and it, G2 clearly had a plan, which was to play the pike into the Nautilus and draft that on red side in the second round of the draft because they were waiting to see if it was going to be flexed and, and if that was going to have any kind of effect. You can see that they try and take some picks away from uh, Crisp with the Blitzcrank and the Braun band's pretty weird. <laughs> that one's pretty weird. Um, but I think like FPX got what they wanted. They got the playmaking on the Nautilus to feed the side lanes. Sivir and Gangplank are going to be extremely powerful late. I do question why the Elise was taken instead of the Jarvan this first game, because I think Jarvan, we've talked about this previously on this show at Worlds, but Jarvan into Sivir, I think is at least can lock the Sivir down and prevent a lot of the damage in the late game. If you can get her outside of the auto attack range to mm -hmm. ricochet all over your entire team. So the Elise is a little weird because it's obviously it's also harder to gank because of the spell shield that Sivir has. So I don't know what G2 It looks as though it's because basically Jarvan's the only champion Yankos played at Worlds that he hadn't won on. So it looks like he just had no confidence individually on that, I'm guessing. Off of Jarvan matchup I think he into, played all year. Yes. Jarvan matchup into Lee is a little brutal. Okay. I mean, there's I mean, there's a lot of obviously things to think about, but but from a team fighting perspective, if you get into late game, like the Jarvan is I think what you want in this mm -hmm. scenario. Um, but I think that the plans to, of FPX just to go ahead and feed the sidelines and get Gangplank and Sivir rolling is really powerful in the late game. So FPX, I think, just has a clearer idea of the kind of composition they're going to be playing here. And unfortunately, like, the pike is there to counter the Nautilus shield. I think we <coughs> can get the execute down on the Nautilus, but if, 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 if basically Cast was late roaming. So if you're not there, it doesn't serve a lot of purpose. Yeah, so to answer Dorn's original question does g2 think they're underdogs going into the series and is that why they're drafting this way i think completely no if you listen to g2's comp or calm and versus semi versus skt after they win they're like we're world champions and it's skt that had all the hype behind them like all the analysts were talking about whoever wins the skt versus g2 series is going to win worlds like so i think all the hype and all the strength was on that bracket and that's how g2 viewed it inaccurately now in hindsight but I don't think going into the series, they viewed it as um, we are the underdogs versus FPX. I think what actually happened is G2 got away with so much bad early game in their quarters and semis just due to the teams they were playing. I think naturally G2's playstyle is really good versus Koreans and pretty bad versus Chinese teams. Um, all Korean teams are very unique. They don't all play the same way, but there is a certain aspect that's kind of the same. They're very, very snow slow to snowball and very slow to end the game. You saw it with SKT's Baron usage. You also even saw it with Damwon's um, Baron usage and Damwon's game versus G2. I think it took up to two elders for them to end the game. Koreans have this idea that once you get Baron, you want to maximize your lead out of it. You want to slowly build your lead, spread into lanes, take turrets. Like the enemy team isn't going to go punch you in the face. And that's what the Chinese teams are doing. That's what Fnatic has done. That's what G2 has done. Whenever they get Baron, they punch you in the face. Like FPX, 
when they got ahead, they never gave the control back to G2. Like G2 loved staying in the ahead position in terms of map state and trying to kind of push people around, tell you, like, look, 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 I'm split pushing bot lane. You have to come deal with me. FPX would either start Baron, FPX would either heavily force engages onto other sites. Like they're very much willing to pull the trigger and they don't play like Korean teams. So I actually think G2's weakness was kind of shored up and kind of uncontested in their quarters and semis. And we really just did not get to see that at finals. Right, before um, jumping into any of the... Oh, go on there, Alice. No, the, 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 the stuff with, with drafting and differences in tendencies <coughs> and stuff, and especially the Korean Barons. SKT got uh, six Barons, right? That was the, the thing that was talked about. G2 got one. I think G2 got one at 32 minutes. Um, one of those Barons resulted in an ace where only one member on SKT ended up living. Uh, the other Barons were taken at points where on the non-scaling team compositions, except for the game where Khan messes up massively and so does Mata as they're pushing the two inhibitors. The other four Barons, if you go to the freeze frames of the games, uh, which I, I don't have the timestamps handily available, the, the waves are in awful spots, and then they're behind in the game team compositionally, even though they have the Barons. Um, so j just because they have the Baron doesn't mean that they can randomly raise turrets or randomly elect to take fights. I mean... Well, One of the no barons, pressure. they their inhibitors were right. pressured a lot of the time. But, sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. But it, we're, we're talking about FPX getting, uh, you know, never giving G two uh, an advantage. But in game one and two, FPX have the better scaling team composition. So of course, if they end up getting leads, it's a lot easier with the better team comp. I mean, regardless, to force of, your lead down your throat. Regardless of SKT having scaling comps or not, or their better state on the map. They always default to three lane, three lane push, and then slowly getting into the two wave, where other teams will let a wave go and force the fight onto them if they feel like they can blow open the game. You see it with Chinese teams, you see it with Fnatic, you see it with G2. Whenever they get a lead, even not versus um, G2, SKT in the RNG game, where RNG has uh, it was Blitzcrank plus one more champion, where. They have the Baron, and immediately they go into three lanes, and they're playing for outer turrets. And it's stuff they say in interviews too, and it's stuff like Koreans actively talk about, and stuff SK like mm -hmm. for, versus RNG yeah. game one uh, game SKT um, Faker TF Ming Blitz. Those are the two things I remember. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pull it. Uh, I'm listening. I'm listening. So yeah, I mean they're in no way worth that using Darren and their idea on how the game should snowball is I think incorrect. Um wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. The problem with this is now we've gone digression. Like you're talking about SKT now. Like yeah. he was making he was making a point about how G2 drafts against FPX though, and he was just contrasting it with the SKT yeah, I mean, by I pointing out basically, yeah, go on and keep going. I brought up the FKT the, point because I'm saying Basically, today, this is the implication. The implication is this that G2 have like obviously problems in the early and mid game, don't they? Like obviously SK, uh, the problem is against SKT it was just masked as LS said by the fact that actually they had the better comps and that SKT was misplaying the map basically, right? Yeah. Like I mean, if I, I put it this way, if, we, if I rephrase what F LS was sort of saying there, weren't you kind of making a point LS that like basically SKT could have exploited some of these weaknesses in G2. It's just that SKT themselves had a fl flawed vision on how the game was. So they didn't exploit any of those advantages. Like they never got massive leads. Like the problem was they had leads, but if you looked at the draft, they weren't massive leads, were they? They were tiny leads. Yeah. I mean, I, I just looked up the SKT Baron and mm -hmm. they're, they're down... Uh, I mean, RNG has a better team composition. They have a Mordekaiser versus Renekton, Gragas, Thresh, Ezreal, and AP Twisted Fate. So you can't just walk into Mord. It's 22 minutes in the game when they got the Baron. They don't have any side lanes that they can buff Baron minions with. Um, and they're, I mean, RNG has double Infernal. RNG is ahead, even though SKT has Baron. So what, what do you want them to do? I want them to actually group and actually push lanes instead of spreading out into three lanes and allowing themselves to get caught every single time they have Baron. But if, if they group, they'll lose a fight. And if they get, if they spread out, then they get caught. And what if it, then, I mean, if you're not going to so use it's... Baron to actively force and actively force waves onto other people and start seizing, then that Baron is fucking meaningless. Yeah, so if you can't group because you'll lose a team fight, just because you have Baron doesn't mean that you can magically do something with it. They're behind in the game. If they group and RNG just decides to team fight, they're going to lose. So the, of course first they Baron, the first Baron FKT took, they weren't behind at all. They could have easily yes, thought. Sure, it's I can go minutes. pull up the game. No, no, I mean, it's 23 minutes. Are we minutes talking about no, this game? No, 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 no I know, I know. But, I know. A group my, stage my, fucking game of neither team is talking about. Okay, sure, but man, know, just sure, use it to make the point generally, though, yeah. My point is, Korean teams were god-awful at snowballing, 
And G2 played two Korean teams in a row where they were yeah. god awful at snowballing. So yes. their mid and late game, where we talk about their macro, their ability to play from behind, is um, their weakness it just weren't tested as much. Let me ask you this, local, semis. right? Just in conjunction with what you're saying now, mm -hmm. are you which which of these two opinions do you lean more towards? You don't have to pick one, but which mm -hmm. which on a spectrum would you lean more towards? I'll put on the left hand side. I'll say that as you're saying here, G2 basically they were who. They always were. It's just that in the final, it took FPX to expose them. Like the other teams couldn't do it. Like maybe SKT had a chance, but weren't themselves able to. Maybe Dam One couldn't do it because they couldn't even get into position two. The other option is G2. For whatever reason, the, the other series were different enough, and then the final they massively underperformed. I think do you actually I, think I, that they got like? What, did they get exposed? Like like did they play at a similar level? Just people couldn't expose them in the plus rounds, or did them simultaneously playing bad make this look way worse? Sure, where I think I think both are true, but I lean a lot towards um, G 2s weaknesses with not exposed in semis and quarters. Okay, so that's one thing. Yeah, way, I, will say, I will say. I will say. I will say. Until the moment they lost the final, I actually myself didn't really look back and take stock of the fact. Like, holy shit! For a team that was in the final, they had a lot of like fucking touch and go moments in this tournament like you had the day two in the group stage even against like damn one they were fairly like you know what was no what what season am i thinking of who they who did they play in the griffin quarters? griffin griffin, oh, damn one, yeah. griffin damn one skt they play three korean teams in a row yeah so there was the damn one one so like a griffin one another no damn one that's right so that one was like i don't know even then they had some times so, and that they were a bit dodgy just, so yeah go on just seg segueing this back all, all i'm trying to say is that just because teams have advantages, the, the team compositions have to be taken into account, as well as all the variables, like, uh, currently inside of the game. Um, right. If the side lanes are really ugly, it's going to take, who knows, a minute, minute and a half to fix them. Uh, what is the actual game state? What's the likelihood of winning a team fight? How many turrets are still up? What is the dragons on each team? Like, does the defending team or the losing team have more infernals or something? Mm -hmm. Um We've seen scaling team comps win grossly imbalanced map states. I remember Loki versus Dom One is a nice example. And it's not like Dom One's not misplaying, but sometimes the responsibility on the team that is ahead is so high and the margin for error is so slim that they have to play to such a higher ceiling than the opponents because the opponents have more forgiveness so, due to draft. Well, this is just segueing back into drafts. Uh, without without getting too much into draft, I think my original point regarding with like Korean teams are really bad at snowballing with Baron, and that's why G two wasn't really exposed to like Chinese teams being able to do it or other European teams. What's your general take on Korea with Baron and their ability to snowball? Um, Korea with ba I, yeah, I, I agree with you that Korea has the general idea that when you're ahead, get more ahead, um, in a less volatile way, whereas um. In G2, even even against uh, SKT, I'm trying to think what, what game it was. I think it was in game number two. Um there were there was the there was the there was they were pushing the inhibitor and there's the two open inhibitors versus SKT. And for some unholy reason, uh, G2 with the better scaling team composition allows Renekton to walk around and get an entire flank and get access into the very meat of the team for no reason, right? Um, and so a team fight ends up going really poorly, yeah. Uh, because the the overall way that they conducted their Baron push wasn't covering all angles. So I agree with you that Korea tends to be much more safe. I mean, they've they've done this in every esport they've ever touched. Uh, they have the idea that when you get ahead, you get more ahead. Whereas yeah. in Europe and even China, they they will err on the side of volatility more, and sometimes it ends up making you look really bad, and you can lose things that you shouldn't have been able to lose. Like game three, FPX versus G2. So that's my viewpoint on the finals. G2 had weaknesses that were never tested. Like FPX, had, of course, isn't a perfect team and they were pushed on yeah. their weaknesses. But that's why overwhelmingly we're like, oh man, we're about to see a grand slam. Oh man, like G2 is yeah. the favorite going into this series where the, all the matchups leading up makes G2 look so strong. It makes G2 look untouchable. Yeah, but you, you have to remember, like, look at where this started, guys. Because I feel like this is losing a lot of the context. Remember yeah, that yeah, Fun Plus yeah. Phoenix was in probably the easiest group we've seen at Worlds ever. And even right. then, they were playing... I don't think they were tested until the, the final, let's be real. Yeah, that, that's my point. Final. Like, But I do think that one thing, one takeaway here is, again, going back to the semifinal draft, 
I think they had a very smart idea about how to deal with the shy, playing, letting him have the Vladimir, playing things like Mordekaiser into it just to delete him from these team fights. And I think if we look at the drafts, I, I really think that this, the drafts were hugely important in this series because mm -hmm. SKT going back, the Kiana pick again, we keep going back to it, <coughs> but it was banned the first three games by SKT. And then when they let it through, when SKT didn't ban it and they picked it, Faker was horrible on it. So the Kiana wasn't a major factor in that series, and I think that really warped the way that G2 was able to pick and ban in that draft because they were not the ones who had to ban the Kiana. You get into this next series, and then all of a sudden that becomes a necessity, which means that all of a sudden there's a ton of pressure onto the jungle pool in general, and FPX comes in and they just they just go ahead and first pick Nautilus. Like they are playing very hard for some of these picks that we know they they really prioritize. Nautilus, Rise, uh, the Galio. I mean, Doan B just got to do Doan B things because mm -hmm. there were a couple games here where G2 is on red side, which means they had their first ban phase was Pantheon and Kiana. Like they had to ban okay. both of these heroes, right? Um, which is really, really hard because then you only have one more ban left before the first pick comes in. And they decided to ban, you know, Zaya and then Rakan, which gave Zaya over to Fun Plus Phoenix in the third game. So yeah. I, I don't know. Like, I think it's really hard because I think basically Fun Plus Phoenix got to play this game exactly the way they wanted to, which is how, you know, to pop some of these credit, which is how he said they were going to win. But I think that what happened was that because there were two red side games in the first three for G2, their bans were extremely limited as a result of not being able to play this Kiana and like mm -hmm. their fear of giving it up. Right. And so that just led to a really easy draft, I think for fun plus Phoenix. Usually pick and ban is always about trading, right? It's not like you get something <laughs> and I get nothing. Yep, and G2 didn't trade. They just gave <coughs> fun plus Phoenix shit. Well, yeah, uh, G2 can't I, make favorable trades because I feel like Nautilus is favorable for Fun Plus Phoenix. Whenever G2 takes it, they're not able to flex it. Uh, Fun Plus can, and also Rides is favorable for Fun Plus. Turn your camera on and off, Loco. Your webcam's just knocked up. We can still hear you, but uh, your really? camera's just... No, he's okay. Don't, don't he's okay. 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 Oh, is it just on me? Yeah. Oh, no um, I think G2 can't make proper trades because things that, you, even if you normally trade, doesn't have the same kind of value for G2. The only champions that I feel like have more value for G2 is Zaya and Yasu, and like Monty talked about, when you ban Gragas, Yasu loses value, and Zaya is always getting banned, or Funplus is first picking it, so there aren't picks that G2 can take that's giving them more value than it is giving to Funplus Phoenix. I think this draft was really masterful, honestly, by Funplus Phoenix. Just like I thought the draft, like I said, was very good in the IG series. But I guess I expected that more because obviously there's a pretty intimate knowledge between those two teams having competed consistently in the same region together and having done a lot more research throughout yes. the years or throughout the year what i thought was really amazing is how fun plus phoenix managed this draft in particular and i think like warhorse their draft coach deserves like a lot of credit for this how is one thing this was i want to get into actually because if you remember one of the reasons i actually came down the g2 side and said i thought they would win because if you remember i myself said in the studio like logically a reason why it absolutely is fair to pick FPX to win is like the best players on FPX are the fucking jungle and support. And that actually looked like the worst players on G2 over this tournament, especially coming into the finals. So to me, I already thought there was a problem there, but putting that to one side, I thought that the one reason why this might be really interesting is I thought it would be G2 that would explore the draft play. Like they would explore to the draft phase. Like they would do all like picks no one's done before. Sadly, the picks they did that you weren't expected were just crap. Like they just weren't good. Like so. So here's the thing. I pick. Like as soon as I saw that, my heart sunk instantly. So here's the thing. So like I talk about. Wins. I talk about G 2s red side being problematic, right? So you would think their blue side draft would be good, right? You mm -hmm. think, okay, well, at least in game two when they get blue side, they're going to have a lot of choices. But their blue side draft was just horrific. So and what I, what I mean by that is, look at this. So they ban Renekton Nautilus. So finally, they get a couple bans here where they don't have to ban the Pantheon. Okay, they're not going to first pick the Kiana because they're not good at it. Let's move past that. They have to ban the Kiana. So what do you do when you first pick? So they, they see Pantheon, Syndra, and Zaya banned on the red side by Fun Plus Phoenix. Now, Kais is up in this situation. They're going to first pick Gragas. The problem with that is as soon as they first pick Gragas, then Kaisa and Rise go on the other side, and they're forced into the Yasuo to partner with the Gragas because unless they could play, I guess... Ezreal here, which is the other thing that we know that Perks plays. 
So they get sort of baited into this Yasuo pick, which I think is just ridiculous. Like, why would you not first pick Kai'Sa in this scenario? I know you want to threaten the Gragas flex, but the, the jungle pool is not at all pinched at this point in time. So you're going to have the opportunity to potentially, you know, play what you want out of the jungle position. Now, yeah, you might give up the Gragas, but then you can take the Lee Sin, you can take the Elise still, you can take the Jarvan, which we've seen in this series. But I think that taking away the Kaisa has got to be the priority on that first pick side. Um, I, I well, uh, so you're talking about game two. Game right? two. Okay. Uh, I, I wanted to just add on game one really fast, and then oh yeah, go for it. Game two. Um, they they first pick Nautilus, which his theme is that no matter what, even if you flex him to support, he has he has pick concepts, he has engage. Yep. He doesn't really have another mode where he can just simply disengage or offer buffer room. Uh, G2 responds Varus and Rise. Uh, FPX then responds Lee Sin and Sivir. Two more short range champions uh, that have to engage into you, even though Sivir has a scaling component. And then G2 Esports, even with counter pick uh, on, on red side, they elect to pick Tom Kench rather than take Gangplank. If they take Gangplank there, you have Gangplank ultimate, which is inviting Lee Sin, Sivir, and Nautilus into you. They can't just fight inside of a GP all. They can't beat the scaling of Rise and Gangplank. They have three thematic champions that have to engage into you. The onus is on them now. You can flex Gangplank and Rise mid and top lane, which means that those are two. I mean, Gangplank doesn't have a losing matchup except to Rise. So Gangplank can't lose, Rise can't lose. And then you get to pinch the support pool. And because you have counterpick support, you can even pick mage supports, which Mickey X can play regardless of G2 sure. can it's actually very willing to pick them. Yeah, so at that point, you can fifth pick Zyra if they do something like pick Braum with Sivir, or they pick Thresh with Sivir, well, not Thresh, but <laughs> if they pick a melee support with Sivir, you can pick Zyra, you can pick Brand, you can pick Soraka, and then you can just laugh at them. The Elise is nonsensical. The Elise is off theme with the Varus and the Rise. There's no bridge that needs to be connected because FPX has already showed you that they're willing to come into you. I mean, FPX is banning away Rek'Sai and Olaf against G2 Esports, even though they want to engage into the opponent. They want to actually run head first. So these champions aren't threatening their team comp. Regardless of whatever Yanko's champion pool is, there's just too many other champions that still exist. So I feel like the entire draft's just a complete blunder. They pick Elise, and then FPX goes Gangplank and, and Thresh, and then G2 is looking at this like, okay, so Ryze has a counter against GP in top lane. We have Nautilus mid lane, but they're still really short range, except for the Gangplank. So at that point, you could still pick a long range mage that has a lot of, of CC and doesn't allow the opponents to get onto you, and they don't do that at all. So they had multiple chances throughout the draft to recalibrate. Yeah, they could they have. Had, they could have. Boy. They could have turned this into a poke or a disengaged comp in the Wh second. Which half they of the should. Draft. Because, as, you're right. And remember, yes. that's supposed to be one of G2's strengths. This is one thing that sucks to me. Is this right. thing, I, the way the games played? Is the way the games played? But one thing that kills me is that was what's supposed to make this the team that wins worlds from the West. Is that they were the only one who ever went against Asian teams, and in theory could have the edge in the draft because, as everyone's pointed out. Like, until you've even drafted against G2, it's like not there's no team you can prepare against because they can always do something different on far, four and five, but they don't. Like, in these right. series, it's almost like at the end, they just give you what you want. Like, what the fuck? Well, it's also, it's also that you can, honestly, you can still take that Tom Kench and you can still give up the gangplank. Like, you can let FPX have this entire comp that they want to have as long as you alter your draft slightly to be a little bit more disengaged or poke-focused, right? Because gangplank is very... So Gangplank is very hard to play if you are moving into Fog of War because you need to set up the barrels and you want people to engage into you. Gangplank Sivir is not awesome synergy, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are playing for poke, then you can absolutely just play for vision control and then have this short range, relatively short range composition walk into you. And you've got disengage with the Rizal, you have disengage with the Tom Kench. As long as you, I think as long as Ellis is right, you play something that is a more poke oriented mid lane yeah because they show face up three melee champions that have to run into you but mm -hmm. if, if you pick gp instead of tom kench uh you you entertain the dual flex gp can go top he can go mid the nautilus can only go well most likely it can only go mid and support uh because gim Goon, and in theory nautilus could go top but it doesn't matter nautilus is losing to both gp and rice so at that point gangplank is basically saying hey I can go all the way up to six items. Rise can go all the way up to six items. Varus can contend with Sivir in short range combat. And you have a Lee Sin that's going to fall off after one and a half, two items and can't do anything. And even if he tries to jump on us, he's going to get rune prisoned. You're not going to fight in the middle of a gangplank ultimate. You're not going to fight in barrels. And you basically say to FPX, the responsibility is on you guys to somehow win now 
in a counter matchup mid, counter matchup top, neutral bot lane where we outscale you and you can't win. I, I, and, I don't know you why. you have to engage into us, which is just really of course. hard. Yeah, yeah. So That's the responsibility and the ask for G2 is so low. The margin forever is so, is, is so high for them. They, they can fuck up so many times because they have so much scaling if they do that. Now, the, the reason that you don't pick Tom here is because you, you give FPX the chance to hang themselves. You, you extend the rope for them to asphyxiate themselves because if they pick a melee support or if they send Nautilus into bot lane, great. Great, you picked a melee support. We're just going to pick Zyra on five. And now suddenly our fucking support scales better than your mid and top laner. Okay. So regarding the whole thing of G2 playing poke champions or G2 playing rain champions, and especially like ones like Zyra that you bring up. So champions like Zyra gets a lot of play the more we see tank junglers and the more we see tank tops, right? When, so traditionally, like it's a little bit counterintuitive, but Zyra beats champions like Thresh, like the short range champions that have to engage on you. But the... Uh, how these melee champions are played and the rain champions aren't played is the combination of Thresh Flash Flay plus giving Lantern to a jungler or the jungler ganking whenever Thresh is in range to be able to um, just open on the Zyra makes it so you can't push up as possible. So like I think in this meta, asking supports and asking teams that really don't have practice on these kind of champions to play stuff like Zyra, to play stuff like Soraka, while theoretically it can be correct, I just don't think it's very realistic. They don't have the practice on it, and it's just not the most ideal meta for it. And in terms of like the onus on the other team to be able to execute, I think FPX loves being in that position. FPX loves being in the position where they have the ball. It doesn't matter how hard the shot is, but they love being able to execute on like a set play, execute on a team fight, execute on a gank. Like that's how that's been their bread and butter. Like even in this game where I don't know why, but G2 let FPX get the map split that they wanted. G2 actively sent three members bottom in level one, and they let FPX split yeah, the, the map. Yeah, the vertical jungling side. in game one yeah. was pretty crazy that they allowed that three-minute fucking Nautilus gank in top side was. Mm -hmm. The fact that like they're like, okay, you can do this, and then FPX loves that dive. That dive where Doinbi does, he teleports level yep. three top lane. It was really well done. Minion. Like that dive seems so practice. I don't think that's like a spur of the moment thing. That's something FTX runs all the time and they're just being allowed. So I agree with you in theory. <clears throat> the FG2 can pick those more kind of poke champions and it can work maybe in a different meta where that's more practice for G2. But as we even talk about G2, as they're a team that can play everything, like they arrived at an identity they were comfortable with like their identity wasn't play everything like they were champions that they couldn't play they couldn't play kiana well as fpx they can't play mid nautilus well as fpx and they had their limitations so local so, let me ask you this well, so yeah go on alice no what, what, what but in, in in analysis what does that like if, if, we, if we can acknowledge or concede that these things are advantageous mm -hmm. why haven't they been practiced towards over the last month and a half or even for a while since the, these these are fundamental strategy concepts so execution opponent... level i think for those are really high like if we no, want it's the opposite about... okay well well i think it's the execution... opposite because you're acknowledging that fpx has the onus to do something right the responsibility is on them well they have the ability to like okay they... so sometimes so... it's way easier to be aggressive and sometimes it's way easier to be defensive and scale and teams pick up on that and then teams make a meta call right now in this meta it's easier to scale so let's pick scaling champions. Right now in this meta, it's easier to snowball. So let's pick the snowball. And that's like the call that teams are making. There are certain metas where people pick tanks, people pick but like long range backline AD carries, like Hogma Twitch, like these are the things that are popular. And there are certain metas where people prioritize stuff more like Lee Sin, Elise, um, early game champions that can make dives. And I think we're in a meta where the onus to engage, the onus to do something is much more favorable. And those are the conclusions that people are arriving at. Then why did scaling teams win all throughout Worlds? I think FP, we can talk about it as like scaling teams, but I think teams that just executed better won. Like sometimes they had more scaling champions, sometimes they didn't. And as we saw, champions like Kale drop off. Like I don't think Kale got touched at all in the pick and ban. I think, and she was she like didn't. the yeah. poster child for look at me. To I be fair, scale. neither of these teams are good at Kale. Mm -hmm. But I mean, sure. the, the but, good but, Kale but, teams but, didn't make it through. How can we how can we say though that the onus or responsibility execution is somehow lower? We're we're talking about world class elite players, and mm -hmm. you're saying that I mean, these world class players... elite players can't play 
stuff like Kiana, right? Even when you're world-class elite, like you have a strategy right. that you're good with, you're a strategy you're comfortable with, you have a strategy you're practiced on. Right. So you're at your asking five players to simply go even and wait, but that's somehow harder than you're asking timing. five players to go even and wait versus five other good players that have early execution tools. If yes. it's world class and those five players, like if it's at equal skill level, the teams with better execution tools are going to be able to execute better and it's going to be able to snowball. Then why doesn't all the games at Worlds support that? I mean, because there are skill differences, because people make mistakes, but I think generally the teams that have execution tools have been able to do it. And I think that's what, um, what is it? Join B and like they sh like I don't think Nautilus is like a very well scaling champion. Like no, it's not. I, I think like that being like Join B's yeah. like core pick and that's what they're able to do shows like if you can execute things, like this is how you can snowball. You this is what you can do. Like they're not like scaling. I I didn't feel like FPX was like scaling on G2. What I felt was like, man, FPX is executing so well. They're setting records for the first turret taken, like the shortest amount of time it takes to take yeah. first turret, the shortest amount of time it takes to take Baron. It didn't feel like a scaling victory to me. It felt like, oh man, they're just able to... What about this then? Because here's, here's one area that this is making me think about in this final, which also went so different to how I imagined the match would go, which is one of the reasons why G2 is supposed to be impossible to play is because of all this playmaking potential, because of how they'll do picks specifically to allow them in the game. Like, obviously, they thought this Caps was fucking... Pike was going to get rolling and take over the whole game and probably dive every side lane. But the problem is, this is the interesting detail to me, What's the team that ends up absolutely comprehensively beating G2? It's not a team that are making all these genius, like, split-second moves in the game. It's a team that comes in with a concept in the draft already, which they execute. Come into the game with a concept they want to execute. They even, as you're saying, look like they have set players that they're literally running. Like, how many fucking times did FPX pull off, like, a four-man versus two people dive on, like, the top lane in this series? It's got to be, like, two or three times minimum. Like, normally, G2 would respond flawlessly to these. Like, normally well, in the game, they were always, like, making the right move. But this time, they would look like they were the ones being led by FPX the whole way. I, I, think, I think there job. were, like, three factors in that, which is that, first off, I think Wonder was super underwhelming this series. And I think that... Especially when he got rise twice for fuck's sake. That's <laughs> supposed to take over the game. And I think that Yankos was also... It seemed like he wasn't communicating well about what the jungle pathing could be. Because especially, like, you look at three minutes into that first game again when that dive goes down, and we already know that FPX has forced the vertical jungle, and you should know that that's going to be coming, right? Yeah. You should know that that is exactly what's going to happen. And FPX basically just gets a free execution on a set play, like you're saying. And yes, they had good invades that did create vertical jungling situations. And then the other factor is Caps was just sort of a step behind this entire I, series. Your Pike, your Pike into Nautilus, like I don't, that's the pick that was so outrageous to me. What You had a week to practice, you didn't practice Kiana, and that was your conclusion. I'm going to pick a champion that can't push onto Nautilus, that's going to get pushed in. Doinby likes to roam around. That's also a uh, melee champion, so it's easy for Doinby to... Uh, go ahead. P Pike doesn't play the lane. He gets Predator Boots, and he never plays in the lane. Mm -hmm. He, he, but, he, he actually goes down two levels to the enemy mid laner, and he constantly runs around the map. I, like I said, the concept here was clearly just to, like, fucking... No, I, I, million kick no, ganks off. Right? Mid Pike is, is really unique. Um, it, It's intentionally willing to go down 80 CS, 100 CS, two levels, and rely on catch-up XP, and mm -hmm. it, it's meant to uh manipulate the top and bot lane states so that it's your just, bot lane is really ahead and your top lane is really ahead. It's just and so you ignore weird. the enemy. It's just so weird because if that's their goal, if the goal is for Pike to roam, why do they have yeah. a Varus like Tom Kinch bot lane? Like if your goal is to roam with Pike and you have a Varus Tom Kinch bot lane, like that's not a lane you can roam to and like really get stuff done. Like Cyber Thresh is so fine wave clearing, and then you can't even go top because the map got split. Like, regardless of, like, how they wanted to play Pike, I just think, even if that's how they wanted to Pike, if Caps wanted to roam, like, the early game setup and rest of the pick just does not allow for him to do that. So that pick was just so outrageous to me. This is why I asked earlier whether or not you actually thought that psychologically G2 themselves acknowledged they were in any way a weakness. Because what's weird is when I look at these drafts, this doesn't look like a team that's like, right, well, we've had bad early games, so we better get some good early. It's like, no, like what LS is saying, if anything, their whole read on the tournament was like, yeah, you know what? Our early games fucking sucks. Let's just scale and hope that works. Yeah, I mean, that's, they must be brilliant actors if they felt like they were underdogs. Because like, 
I don't think it was them acting. Like after FKT comes, they're talking about, oh my god, we're gonna win worlds. Like, you know, calm down. We still have to play them. Calm down. Like, it. it I don't think someone can convince me. Like, no, put it this way, okay. As I said, as I said, it's unlikely they actually did really think that. Like, I mean, just the, I, the yourselves, if you beat SKT, you would think you were going to win the tournament. But put it this way, like the way that they drafted did imply that they thought that they had, like basically they, like, as I always say, they thought these were the correct drafts. Like they thought they got mm -hmm. what they wanted in theory. Like they actually liked these decisions. We didn't, but that's because we, we, we aren't them. So we would choose to execute the game differently. What I don't understand personally is like, LS is talking about it here, but I just don't understand how they ever thought that this game one draft was going to win the game. Like, I don't know. Like I remember watching it and thinking, like, Wunder better go fucking ham here, otherwise this game. I, mean, over. I don't. I don't understand how they thought any of these drafts were going to win the game. Like mm -hmm. actually, I mean, like local. Look, look, a question I want to ask you the earlier. Game, the the last pick, Vagar. Who is Vagar going to kill on Fun Plus <laughs> Phoenix? I also, Vagar. Who's he going to kill? Bio versus Galio. Like the whole point. Oh, Caps was fucking trolling Wait, the what? draft what? here. What? Wait, wait, what? No, game, game three, G2 so far ahead, and Vigar <laughs> annihilates the whole team. Huh? Okay, let's go for it. Okay, at G2 don't have to push, or G2 don't have to do anything until they scale. So FPX has to somehow do something. How, how does FPX engage into Vigar Event Horizon? They get dragons, they get barons, they <laughs> okay. get more control. I, I mean, they map, don't they necessarily okay, have so. to engage. As long as they have vision control, It's the onus is on G2 to engage into them, in which case they're very well set up for that. But it's the, No, there's there's no onus. They just go till 30 minutes, and then they win every team fight. But before 30 minutes, they're losing... Before 30 them. minutes, Ryze is beating GP, because Ryze is the only champion that beats GP. Before 30 minutes, Vigar is beating Galio. He's behind on Pryo until first recall. So Ezreal and Nautilus fell really far behind. Absolutely. I have no idea why Yanko's path the way that he did early game. He should have been able to be there in bottom. I agree with you that Rides beats GP, but when the thing about FPX is because they get so much mid and jungle Keep going, control, I'll be back. Okay. No, 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 but they get so much mid and jungle control for Rides to beat GP, Rides has to play up. Rides has to not be afraid of the jungler and Rides has to be able to like smack down GP. But when you're in a situation where you constantly see the Galio Mia, you constantly see the Lee Mia. You don't have control on your top side jungle. Wright can't smack down GP the way he wants to. Like the range matchups that beat the melee matchups can't play the way they want to when they're losing control on mid and jungle side. So I think FPX slowly bleeds out. Like FPX is like giving up stuff, giving up stuff, like giving up dragons. Sure, there we can talk about like them having a comp advantage like in the end game in like the 30 minute plus. But when you give up enough dragons, when you give up enough map state, yeah. when you give up enough Baron. It's really hard to like take advantage of the lead that you have. Well, if they if they get clouds and oceans, it doesn't do anything, right? I it it it's less relevant for sure. Okay, so uh, all all I want to discuss, I guess, in this instance, is the variable. So fifty percent of the time, dragons are going to spawn that don't matter. That matter less, but yeah. Okay, that matter less. Okay, and then uh, they don't have the strongest infernal team composition. So really, they're they're looking for mountain drakes to do baron. So sure. they don't have the fastest Baron taking potential, which means that the Baron, even with a Mountain Drake, is probably going to take upwards of 20 seconds or something like that. So mm -hmm. Vigar should be able to get till 25, 30 minutes. I mean, they did get to that point in this game. They ended up giving up a Baron because of poor play leading up to it. 25 minutes and 10 seconds, they take a team fight that they don't have any business taking. Um, they and uh, 2150, uh, they're pushing a mid tier one when the second Mountain Drake of the game is coming up in 30 seconds. They end up giving over the Baron because they're fighting over 500 gold. I, I, but, underst I understand what you're saying, but I think when it comes to the execution of these team fights, if if you're playing into Phoenix's dragon con or like vision control, it's really hard for G2 to set up. I think it's really hard for them to walk in. I also think it's really hard for Jarvan to get an effective ult off here because ev there are multiple champions that can escape the ultimate or you can dodge it outright. And so... I just don't know how they play into a bunch of vision control that Fun Plus Phoenix already has. Like, yeah, they're well set up if under the scenario that Fun Plus Phoenix has to engage into them. But yeah. if if the the vision control is already on Phoenix's side, I think they really have a lot of difficulty. So, uh, Jar Jarvan flag Grant's vision, right? If he throws it, Grant's vision, Ezreal Q, Ezreal R, four blue trinkets. Yeah, but that's flag a RW. It's still a slow process to move in, and even if you see yeah. somebody, that doesn't mean you're going to be able to engage on them. That's the problem. Yeah, sure, but they don't have to engage because all their champions scale better. 
I'm not so, I'm not sure that that's, that's a universal truth that you don't have to engage just because your champions scale better. No, what what I'm saying is it, like even even in this game I believe G2 even get an infernal dragon, right? But they have they have Rise, J4, Vigar, Ezreal and Nautilus. So no one can really get on Ezreal. Ezreal has really good repositioning. Event Horizon quite literally shuts down every member on FPX except for Gangplank. If he has his W. Zaya doesn't have freedom to move inside of fights. The way that FPX has to itemize. Vigar gets to go all the way to six items. Rise gets to go to six items because everyone on FPX is melee. Mm. Jarvan can go off tanky and still be a threat because FPX only realistically has one carry, which is Zaya. So if the game goes to 30 minutes and all of a sudden G2 can suddenly do a Baron, even without a Mountain Drake in 15 seconds or something, they can slowly move in with blue trinkets and skill shot checking. And if FPX try to pull the trigger, Event Horizon shuts everything down. I guess I guess I don't understand how you expect them to get to that point, considering that... How do they survive those 30 yeah, minutes? Yeah, exactly. Like, before you know, it becomes OP or whatever. You know, you're dealing with the double tier, the tier in each of the side lanes, and the scaling of the Rod of Ages, right? So you're going to be weaker early. Galio is going to be able to roam, which Doenby does. Uh, you have a winning matchup in the jungle. I, I agree that you have a losing matchup in top lane, but I think that can be mitigated, like Loco saying, by the Rise having to push and pressure, and it's very hard to do that. He did get a significant CS lead, if I'm recalling correctly. but He did, he did. Yeah, it's, it, it can, it's harder to do that when there's a Lee Sin and, and a Galio there, and also a Thresh potentially roaming on the map, because Thresh can just leave this lane. Mm. So the, Thresh, for, yeah. the way LS wants teams to play, I think can be theoretically correct, but for it to be correct, like, the counterplay to that is like you're slowly checking in and then you, what if it mistook a champion being somewhere and they're able to get an engage on you. You're trying to farm at your turret and you miscalculated like how close you can be and then they get an engage on you and then you die. And then when you're trying to scale like and the enemy kills you at turret and they dope you, like you can get blown open, like you can lose an inhibitor, like you can do a Baron. The onus to scale and the onus to give up vision and play put so much pressure on players and... One thing that Papa Smithy said that I really agreed with was, or I didn't actually agree with it, and then I went back and thought about it. The last three World Finals that we had have been 3-0, have been 3-0, have been 3-0. Playing yeah. from behind, something that G2 has been incredibly good at, even like on World Stage, on World Final Stage, I think it's something extremely hard. It requires you to track them and have that information and not make mistakes. And when you make that yeah. one mistake, you get blown open. If you don't make that mistake and you keep getting to that point, you keep getting to that point, you keep getting to that point, yes, you can outscale, but before you get to that point, there even the smallest of mistakes might force Just you to Just think about what LS open. said earlier when he said in game three that like they didn't even get to the point he was talking about because they themselves opted well, they into a team fight before then. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, well, the, it, it, it requires yeah. teams to make perfect decision making. and it No, but I mean, that's one of the reasons why, personally, like, it, like, cause League's such a strategical game, but you all have to be on the same page. One of the reasons I think in the finals why it goes to shit is, like, for example, if you're ever 2 0 down, Dude, when the team... Go and watch every World's Final where someone's 2-0 down. The team that's even fucking loading in 0-2 is like... It's like... There's a saying in combat sports, like boxing, MMA, like that sometimes someone's looking for a way out of the fight. Like they know they're losing the fight. They're getting the dog shit beat out of them. And so you know what? In MMA, sometimes people, no joke, like basically sort of give up the choke, for example. Like they get, they're in a wrestling, they just sort of like give it up. That's not like they literally like choose to lose. It's like in that moment, they're so frustrated that nothing's working that they're getting wrecked that they know yeah. they're gonna lose that they just sort of try just anything last second like well fuck it so like i wasn't surprised at all like like we're talking about this draft here like the problem here ls is this is if this was a bo1 in a tournament where you're not eliminated after this game maybe they could execute it like you're saying but like i wouldn't rely on my team down zero or two getting their shit pushed in to actually do like you're saying sort of like like well, like babysit this comp all the way to the point it's OP and then just win off like the game yeah. conditions. I, I I wouldn't trust a team to be able to keep the keep it together mentally to do that, you know, in a final. Well, FPX had a really strong early game in game three. Can, uh, can we agree on that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, but they have a strong early game in Mate, every what, game. Like, let's be real. <laughs> when they had a strong early game so, in every single map, didn't they? Right, right. Because, so, <laughs> what, what I'm trying to say is that what occurred in game three's early game, the with the bot lane turret and perks falling as far behind as he did, mm -hmm. at 15 minutes, G2 still ahead. Despite an absolute tragedy happening that would, if, you, if they play this game out, uh, you know, 100 times or something, that level of failure probably wouldn't occur it was a very gross imbalance sure i 100 agree okay with that. 
So if 15 minutes, nothing's happened, the score is 0-1 in G2's favor, mm -hmm. and they, they're ahead everywhere. What do you mean by ahead? Compositionally, they're ahead. The game is even. If, if G2 is even, they're ahead. I don't want to go back and open up and check the game again, but in terms of being ahead, there has to be like a lot of other parts, like how much dragons do they have? Did the core items get finished? How much vision control do you have on the map? How well, pushed in are you? I think those factors so also it, come into yeah, like, sure. are, are you ahead on the map or not? So it's 17 minutes or something, they get infernal, right? Mm -hmm. And then the score is 1-1. One, one. So it's 17 and a half minutes, it's 1-1, one to one, and they're down 2k gold. Mm -hmm. So they're ahead in the game, team compositionally. Because if, if a team fight breaks out right now, mm -hmm. FPX doesn't have a they don't their items aren't strong enough to siege tier twos. There's no Baron on the map. There's no objectives. Mm -hmm. The next dragon doesn't come up for five minutes. They can't do anything. They can't force G two to fight. It's not within their kit. It's not within the champion's theme. So no matter what, for the next five minutes, we're guaranteed to scale. So you factor in the average GPM with I items. Mean, I just change. I just don't agree with that. Like again, it, just thinking about it, it, it there's still a lot of pick potential you can make here. You can GP alt globally, right? You could make yeah. long range engage plays under. You can tower dive them very easily with a Lee Sin and a Galio and a GP alt and a. Th how, right? how against Vagar though? You don't have to. You can go. You can play away from Vagar. Like, like sure, right. sure. So okay. So if you if you go away from Vagar, minions spawn every thirty seconds. So there's variables in the game that have to happen. So we're talking about five professional players that are in voice comms with one another. And we're, we're making the argument that somehow the team that knows that all they have to do is sit back and defend can't do that against the team that has to control vision, time minion waves with one another. That this might sound like a... This, listen, this, um, this might sound like a completely pointless uh, interjection, but I will just say one of the themes, Monty can back me up on this, that yeah. I have never understood about League of Legends from day one and has actually made me no joke... Like, I'll just be real. I have a chauvinism against League of Legends pros where I think most of them are stupid. Like, actually stupid. And one of the reasons why is what you're describing right now. Like, Monty, how many times have I told you I couldn't handle watching NALCS, watching the team with a fucking split push comp opt into 5v5 Baron team fights and lose the game? Yeah, like, I, like, I that. I can't what? comprehend that everyone tells me League okay. of Legends is a strategical game with all these factors, and then ninety nine percent of games are just a bunch of five fucking plebs like my bronze yes. games just engaging into each other round a baron. Like, and this is in twenty nineteen for God's sake. Like, if you want to think, by the way, that I'm being like like egotistical from another game. No, in other games we have other strategies, and when people know them, they execute that strategy. The problem with League is. At the end of the day, you can be the best team in the world. You can have the scaling comp. You can have the fucking split push comp. But if that, if the right guy just put, if the right, if the, it's always the support as well, because that's how dumb these pros are. If the support just goes five units inside the game outside of his safety zone, we have to go in on it. Like a laser point to a fucking cat going off a cliff. You <laughs> yeah. must go off that cliff because you've got to get that laser point. Okay. Then. Like, yeah. I can't believe in 2019, this is still a thing. Like, <laughs> the problem with this is LS. Like, basically, as I'm that's a, that's to a you, big problem. If, I, not, if yeah. I was a coach i would never be making comps that were fucking split boss comps i would just be making straight team fight comps 24 7 because league of legends pros cannot be trusted not to take those fucking team fights they can't be i know what you're meaning ls like there's many games i've fought right. in this scenario why would i ever even take a baron i have the tempo on the map like no no let's take the baron anyway because they're letting us like every team does this dumb shit for some reason and no i agree with don't you have infinite practice players don't have infinite practice hours players don't play perfectly on stage so what teams do and what players do in practice, they identify a strategy that works for them. They identify what they think is the strongest in the meta and they play towards that. They're not- No, no, Loco, I'm gonna have to call you out on this. I know what you mean as an abstract point, I agree. But the problem is this, right? I agree with Ellis on this particular game. With the draft they have in game three, Mm -hmm. You have to have that in your mind every second of the game that you're yes. playing. Every second of the game, that. as you look at the map, it should be updating going, this is the, our win conditions, our win conditions. By the way, that's one thing Monty literally invented in League of Legends, you know. No one ever fucking did that. Just laid out the team compositions and what the win conditions were before the game started. People mm -hmm. used to laugh at him and make out like he was an idiot for saying it. Like, no, it revolutionized the fucking game before that. People used to make out like, well, I think they'll win the game because he's got Nasus. It's like they never bothered actually analyzing what would the comp versus mm -hmm. the comp do. Like, how does this one try to beat that one and so yeah. when you actually had that concept like to me the problem i had was monty was out 
outline in it, but then I felt like the players didn't hear him. Like they just went in the game and thought it was solo queue again. And we're playing their fucking lane out. And I'd, I'd, I'd be watching these pit cops going into fighting fans going, what is this? Like, we thought the, like, we <laughs> the reality of it. Like, players like play tend to play a certain way. They sure. practice. players tend to play a certain way under pressure. Play. Badly drafted, then mm -hmm. players tend to play a certain way when they don't have a certain amount of vision. On yeah, that. sure. That's just reality of League of Legends and reality bad drafting, of then, yeah, humans playing. Bad mm -hmm. drafting then, yeah. So, no, I do overall. I do think G two. When you give someone a katana really. sword and they have no I, fucking sword skills, you have by definition equipped them poorly. So you are saying, <laughs> local, this was a bad draft from draft, yeah? Yeah, oh, completely. If you okay, if, fair enough. If I have a like, I don't know what a katana sword beats like, but if I have like a weapon, like if I have an axe, and technically someone with a good katana sword can like kill me with it, but that person isn't very technically apt with a katana sword. It doesn't matter if you have the. Winning weapon. Agreed. Like, I'm yeah, you've you've, you've you drawn it back exactly. Yeah, yes. Sure. Sure. Right. I, I do. I do agree with what Ellis is saying about this draft in general. But I just think like, so I guess my problem with it is I feel like there are so many opportunities. I so I think Thorin put it well, which is that it is very clear what this draft is trying to do, and it is very yes. clear what they're going for. And I agree with Ellis that in terms of execution, like this could have been something. Uh, it was a very winnable game from an execution standpoint. In fact, I don't even think it was terribly difficult to to reach it because it's so crystal right. clear what you're trying to do in terms of scaling. But yes. the problem is, is that there are so many opportunities to make mistakes along the way to the scaling, which they absolutely fucking did. That yes. Thorin's point is maybe this is not the right draft for game three of a grand final when they are going to be a little bit, they're going to have an itchy trigger finger, basically. Like they're going to take fights. They shouldn't, they're going to be, there's going to be some level of okay. nerves at this level of stage. And you kind of are playing a, a different style of comp than you were playing previously in this series. Because we wouldn't look back on the previous two comps from G2 and say, these are scaling compositions. Okay. We would not say that. Well, okay, so in, in game three, you, ju you just said, right, that it's crystal clear what G2's comp needs to do. It's very simple. It's very clear cut. They know what they need to do. And we're sa so that removes a lot of pressure, right? It removes a lot of stress because it's so obvious and simple. What there's they need clarity, to do. There's clarity, but it right, doesn't but remove the stress. Why, the why would you want them to be on playmaking champions that get outscaled and have a clock on them? Because well, that's what ultimately, they're, ultimately that's we, what they're we can't make that on. decision because right. this is only a decision that can be made by the coaches who are listening to the comms sure. and the players, right? Sure. But like, they can't tell you what their mentality was like. Right, right. So I'm, I'm just arguing from the standpoint of. If we agree that they're down 0-2, they're under a lot of pressure, they're prone to make mistakes, they're going to opt into volatile team fights, etc. Why would you put the pressure or the onus on them, the responsibility to outplay their opponents or to require the opponents to make mistakes than just play a watered-down, post-lobotomy created team composition <laughs> like this one? I like the phrase post-lobotomy team. <laughs> like, I, mean, I think there's more, I think so you can argue they there's, still couldn't do it i think there's you can argue there's more pressure to be a scaling team i think there's more pressure to let people have the control i think there's more pressure to keep the map dark i think there's more pressure to be able to keep taps on people and if you miss a tap you get dober a turret gets busted open but Loco, I don't know how you can say that you played starcraft you know mm -hmm. that you don't need to always see the fog of war to know timings these, these are pro players. They know what it well, is. Even isn't. in StarCraft, like people. No, get no, cool. Let, even, like, even oh, let me play that. Let me play. No, but yes, no, but that's exactly you, the you, point. You, if you're playing a certain matchup in StarCraft local, right? Like, mm -hmm. first of all, you're gonna literally you're gonna literally predict what the opponent does based on his level, right? Like, if you're in fucking and deep on IC cup, you're not gonna expect mm -hmm. some next level macro game. You're probably gonna think the fucking Zerg's gonna six pool you. Okay. So whatever it is, right? It doesn't matter whether you scout the six pool. You're gonna keep in mind the whole time. Like, I'm definitely not losing this fucking six pool. So as a result, you're gonna play a little bit safer there and not not take as many yes. obvious gambles, right? So well, the question is, in this scenario here, like basically. Why couldn't they just uh, play safe? But even I'd even I I, I kind of see what Ellis is saying here. What you literally they do could, is it, if harder. you no, but, that's the point I'm going to no, get but, to here. You do it consciously. So for example, you literally even do it like a solo queue game where it's like right. Well, I know that if the jungler can get here at this exact time, three minutes twenty five seconds, mm -hmm. it fucks my whole lineup. So you just don't even play up at that point. You literally give up a few CS because all we're talking about here is getting a couple more minutes in the game. Like it doesn't really matter at that point. Right. Like so, being slightly so, optimal in lane does it? Like you can give some small edges up. 
In StarCraft with tight maps where the rush rush distance is a lot shorter, like people tend to play more all-in comps, people tend sure. to play more aggressive build orders, and people t tend to do more cheesy stuff because those things have a higher chance of winning you the game. In StarCraft maps with long rush distance and long like aerial time, people will play more scaling, people will play more bases, people will expand okay. more aggressively. I think in the current game state for League of Legends, the rush distance for both teams are much, much shorter. And it favors aggressive side way more. And that's what teams are opting into. And that's why teams like FTX are consistently coming out ahead. Then why did you say earlier on that you agree that scaling comps are better? That's the meta. What? You said that no, in the first... I, I did you not. Did? I said execution comps are way better. And I think it's the onus to execute is better. That's what I've been arguing the whole time. Wait a minute. Wait, let's, let's explore that then. That's an interesting point. It doesn't have to be an argument. Like, what I about, mean, like... Like, okay, which other teams execute had execution style comps in this tournament aside from FPX? Who would you pick? Mm -hmm. Outside of FPX, like who executes a lot? I, th I actually think G2 you tended to execute a lot like earlier on, and then they switched their identity for it. Uh, Griffin was actually a team that wanted to play certain comps and they wanted to execute on it. Like, sure, I think G it would be like Griffin, G2, FPX. S SKD, SKT, I would argue, did for a couple of games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they lost to G2 by playing execute comps. Well, I think they lost to G2 with their inability to snowball. <laughs> I think there's a lot of reasons comps. they lost, yeah. but sure. No, sure, sure, sure. But how, I mean, they, it's hard to snowball with some of those team comps. It's hard to snowball if you're SKT. If you're hard to snowball, if you get Baron and you spread into three lanes and you keep trying to farm and you have one of the worst Baron power play on average as a team, I think that's, I, I don't think it was a comp problem. I think it's SKT problem fkt has a team problem the, okay the the only games that g the g2 won uh at worlds were ones where they outscaled their opponents i don't think so i think they're i mean i don't want to go back and check every game no I, well, i'm talking about g2 because it pertains to fpx i think g2 i'm not sure i agree won. with that about g2 yeah. okay i'd have to go back and look at absolutely yeah, yeah, every yeah. game that they played I mean, the, the, the Dom Juan game is a really interesting one. They got 15 turret plates and double Infernal Dragon with a 7,000 gold lead. Why did the game go to one final team fight? Where if uh, if Nuclear played a little bit different, we would have had one more decisive <coughs> team fight where Dom Juan was arguably favored. I, I think pro players would agree Dom Juan would have been favored at that game point. Why was a game with 15 turret plates, 7k gold lead, double Infernal Dragon, mm -hmm. allowed to go to a team fight where if nuclear plays it better, we get one more fight where Dom one's favored because their team comp scale is better. What, how is that allowed? I mean, I think we can also obviously look at playing the reverse poorly. and look at like the scaling comps. Like if they go a certain distance, then they win. Then why do these teams lose? Because people make mistakes because it's a human game. Yes. And I, all I'm saying is that the majority of wins at world came from scaling comps. I literally had an entire Google Doc. I, I know that you know about this. Sounds too, plausible right? to yeah. me. If I think about the tournament, I mean, like, I think if a lot of games that, that would make sense, don't you think so? I mean, Loki beat Dom One. Dom One had three Infernal Drakes, but they were outscaled by Orn items and just team composition. They couldn't do anything. I, I have an entire Google Doc. I think what would convince game. me is like if you if you mark what is it the most scaling champions in the game, right? And then you mark the most aggressive like early game champions in the game not the ones that are being played like let's say like a kogma or a twitch these are like giga scaling yes. champions like these champions aren't played for a reason like kale dropped off for a reason like scaling as a concept like teams didn't favor if like i mean that's an extreme concept, version like, more, yeah like, sure but like yeah. I mean, if that is what's true right yeah like, scaling what's most important then people would <laughs> pick more stuff like orn people would pick more stuff like twitch people would pick more stuff like cog they would pick the strongest absolute like the most giga scaling champions i think the fact that the winning team the signature champion that might get the skin is nautilus and nautilus is a champion that is like that he's gonna get outscaled terribly like after a certain mid game point nautilus is another support like these are the all right what about this so ls part of the yeah. problem here is that classical like if like as local says if you just took this at the most pace value and you took all the champions in league of legends and said which ones are these yeah, are the sure. most scaling ones yeah obviously most of those aren't being played like not least because you can't literally like the old days sit in lane and farm for 30 minutes and hope you can get that point so like presumably mm -hmm. even within the bracket of the scaling champions we have it has to be some that have some agency earlier in the game as well right to allow well, you, you to you get can that have point. You can have scaling champions that win every lane. Gangplank's one of them. If if Rise isn't available on the enemy team, Gangplank doesn't lose a matchup. 
I just think like the two most banned champions at Worlds are Pantheon and Kiana. And I think yes. these champions are extremely like execution heavy, extremely early game heavy. Like Kiana falls off like a rock, like or at a certain point. Um, I mean, Kiana's actually one of those weird assassins if you use your ult correctly, like you can still stay relevant yeah, in the game. Yeah, but but isn't isn't mm -hmm. like a lot of the reason for the Kiana bans that it's a Kiana well, Pantheon's just broken, so mm -hmm. but isn't Pantheon it a lot of the Kiana walls. jungle? Yeah. And you're not really looking for scaling out of the jungle. You're looking for that early game effect to get scaling champions rolling. I think that would probably mm -hmm. be the argument. I, I think the big one is like Kale, like Kale falling off. Like if scaling is that important, why like why isn't Kale one of those first picks, second picks? Because Kale has a theme to her herself. Just because she's a scaler doesn't mean that you can just blind her into any team composition. Certain scaling champions are still vulnerable and weak to other types of team comps. Rise is very weak. All, sca I mean, all scaling comps are vulnerable and weak to execution. Yes, comps. right. So that that's why you can't just pick Kale in a vacuum. The point I'm making here, Loco, mm -hmm. is that he's not making like a purely uh, absolute statement that like all scaling beats everything else. Like he's yeah. implying that like certain scaling champions, which by the way, were in the meta, that also can play the game earlier. Like he's saying like obvious example being Gangplank. Mm -hmm. Like he thinks that was favored overall. Mm -hmm. I don't but, know. The problem is that we'd have to look at the stats. And I mean, we're look, we're disagreeing sensor, on the yeah. temperature of the meta, but I think the temperature of the meta fa favors like early game execution way more so than it does scaling. I don't know about that because then that sounds like itself too broad a statement. My problem is this: I generally agree with LS. Like, there's obviously world where G two in theory could have won this tournament. Like, because for example, if FPX just doesn't make the final, I think G two beats anyone. So in that world, we'd all be talking now about how the tournament was about scaling actually, and about that's how they beat SKT, and that was the secret read you had to have on the meta. The problem is this: because FPX came along, went to the final. I think actually at the end of the tournament, by the way, FPX had probably the most like rigid playing style of any fucking team in the tournament. Like beyond like maybe RNG. G? Like, I'm trying to think of other teams that were played more, like, just exactly well, the, problem the way is you could ban it out, it. right? That was the issue, is that it, this is where I go That's back. why it's execution. This is where, yeah, I, this execute is where I go back to the, the pick and ban phases being so weird, because, again, with two, G2 two games on the red side, they had two mandatory bans in the first rotation, which means that you literally cannot ban them out. You cannot take away their ability to play their style, right? Which, again, we go back to why the Kiana pick is ultimately so important in this series, is because there wasn't a great way to stop them from doing what they were doing. And because mm -hmm. FPX is so incredibly uh, disciplined at this style of play that they run and so well-practiced at it, it, it makes it very hard to play against. There's also not a way for, for G2 to practice against it. Like, they, they, did, they just refuse to play normal, right? They refuse to play like normal. Look, I want to get your take on something. Sure. So coming into the final, you if like if G2 had won this tour, this match, you would have voted Perks MVP of Worlds, right? Yeah, I so people, Didn't you got... find this final unholy bad in that context? Remember, mm -hmm. the guy in his opposing role on the on paper now looks like fucking Uzi I mate. Like he wasn't he didn't but die. You look at you look at his kills, he looks incredible. Like in the game he didn't do much. Like his fucking sport again was just mm. carrying his ass. But like this perks to me, it's it's like he looked very, very, very underwhelming in this file. And look at the draft they're picking for him, mate. They're giving mm. him the picks he wants in theory, right? I mean he's Perks did get more draft resource, and like that's the one arguable thing against G2, right? Why are you picking bot lane both like bot lane all three times in the first rotation and never picking jungler in the first rotation? I don't think Perks played terribly bad. I think G2 lost the map. G2 lost the game from top side of the map, and G2 lost the game from mid mainly than anywhere else. Was Perks amazing? What did Perks look like the best player in the server? No, but I don't think the onus was on him. This is what they kills me though, dude. Like, like as you're saying, like, like when you say that. Come on, dude. You're the guy who just roasted the fuck out of Uzi I because he didn't carry all of Worlds and said that if you get all the resources, it's on you to carry it. You're going to roast Uzi I, but then Perks gets a pass. For this Perks final, where his, team, listen, where his team is first picking bot lanes, including the Yasuo Gragas that in your mind would have won him MVP, right? Shit like that would have been why he'd be the MVP. Like, we're even first picking my lane. Like, I just pick stuff and dominate anyway. Like, he was terrible. I don't think, okay. I'm not arguing Perks played well. I'm arguing perks played bad. I mean, I roasted Uzi I because Uzi is getting 12.5 CS per minute by going to Wolf when they have Baron. Right, what's perks Ezreal, doing? Choosing shooting Ezreal to top lane to deny right. farm from Mordecai. What's perks doing? Huh? Curling like what's a normal per AD carry. While no, he's playing like a subpar AD carry. I mean, while his 
I, th I thought he played like a normal AD carry while his top With all the resources, well. for fuck's sake. Like, Loco, how can you ignore wait, this? Wait, they I, they I, literally wait. said, by the way, Grabs essentially said before this series and draft every game, Perks is the MVP, Loco. You're right, he's going to carry these games. And then when you sit back, you're like, well, what can he do? Why is he in the server then? What are you talking about? Perks will carry one if he can be put in a position to carry. But if it's mid top jungle or being so far behind, if it's top laners getting Doga at level three, I don't think there's much that an AD carry can do. I, oh, I, I think, think this was I think, terribly I think they yeah. were. I think they were putting Wonder in the best position to win this series, honestly. Like, the way I look at these drafts, I think Wonder should have been the one stepping up and should have been the one carrying. Yeah, I mean, you Perks know. isn't in, the, in that role. It's like they're losing the game from top side of the map. Mid is roaming so much. Like, so it's hard for me to, like, point a finger at Perks. You didn't play the best, but... The owner just then point a there. finger at the draft. It's got to be one of the uh, other. Yeah, no, the draft is, I, I do agree. Their draft is bad. That's what I've been arguing <laughs> also. Because here's the sad thing. That's another thing that killed me about this series. Coming into this series, this is another thing I assumed would be one of the immediate ways to win the series. Like this is. Like, I tell you what. After watching this series now. I'll have to make a ridiculous statement here because obviously in reality this won't work. If I coached Griffin, we would have beaten FPX. Because the first thing I would do, step one of the game, is, all right, Doinby, you want to play all your cool picks to you and roam around the yeah. map, right? Chovy, you're bathroom, taking bathroom. the best possible laning matchup right now. All you're doing in this game, Chovy, is smashing the lane in CS. That's all you're doing. And every time you're going to pressure him, put like, mate, what, what the fuck were these picks for caps in this series? It's like you didn't even think this was a good player. I they draft this stuff like Tristana into Rise, which is technically a winning matchup. But Doinby plays a matchup where you're never laning versus the Trist. He's also taking exhaust, so you don't really ever get all in on. And the only time he's like trading on you and pushing up is where Lee is there, so they can win the two v two. Like, just I I don't want to say they understand the meta better, but the way FPX understands the meta and the way they want to run their game plan teams aren't ready for it and teams aren't fully prepped for it. and that is with like them just having so much yeah that's fine tape on fpx like i mean i also think i also think perks wasn't given a really good opportunity to carry this series because the priorities they were banning the zaya and the kaisa and the one time they had a chance to get the kaisa they chose gragas instead and decided to opt into the yasuo which was super telegraphed by the way even though so, Monty, I, I agree with that as a statement in itself. That doesn't work in the context well, of Cinder is also banned all right? year long. The reason why Perks is the best is because he doesn't have to just play the ADC. So that wouldn't work at all. In that so, just so the Syndra was banned the whole series. To be fair, right? So we were talking about Syndra and Yasuo being the non-AD bot lane picks for Perks. Perks, his team decided not to draft him Kaisa in game two as the first pick, so they gave it over. The one time one of those top tier AD carries was available, so he spent his time on Varus and Ezreal and then a game on Yasuo. So I'm not sure that he was necessarily set up for success through these draft phases. Which is why I was so mad that they didn't first pick Kaisa in game two. I will say, though, this is a game where, like, I want to get your take on this, actually, because obviously most players on G2 look bad. I mean, they did get 3-0. They weren't, like, actually that competitive in some of these games even. So what I wanted to ask was this, is it does look on the surface like the jungle and support of G2 got their shit pushed in and they, they were basically the MVPs of the other side of the fucking game. But as I made the point on the last episode, I, I always have a hard time gauging how much jungle and support fucked up if they were never in a position to actually, like, like basically, this is the question. Was it on the jungle and support? Were they supposed to do something in the game to give their laners a chance? Or were they never in a position to because their laners got the shit pushed in? Which, which is more likely? Game one, jungle support fucked up from level one or the yes. team game plan was fucked up. So it's hard to say who fucked up, but with the game plan that FPX is executing and with what G2 is trying to do with the draft itself, there's not much the jungle support can do when the map is split. Game two, this was the Yasuo Gragas game. Game two, Yasuo Gragas game, even before we can really see jungle support do stuff, G2 pulled the team liquid and they sold their soul for the dragon one, the first dragon, the Inferno. And once that dragon fight ended up with G2 getting one kill and FPX getting three kills, that game, jungle support are not in positions to do much. So like that first big play puts jungle in support in like a shit position. Game four, <laughs> They're getting, game they're three. losing turret, or game three. It was another, turret. by the way, it was another vertical jungling game, game three. Yeah, another vertical jungling game, and G2 is losing turret so quickly. Jungle support are in the, in the right position to do things. 
like with everything mentioned, is some of it jungle support fault? Yes, but the overall game plan from FPX to do stuff early, like puts G2 in a position where like I just can't point at Yankos and Mickey be and be like, why you guys why'd you guys play so bad? It's why are you in this position in the first place? Like who is making these decisions to like vertical jungle? Who is making these decisions to draft like this? Who is making that dragon call in game two? Like those are the bigger questions. I uh, I do have which, some questions uh, about their their uh, their prep for level one because like that seemed to be pretty problematic. What what dragon by the way? Uh, uh, Inferno Drake for game two. Oh. Uh. Okay. Wait. What? What about it? They sold their soul. Like Yankos is two hundred. They gave up too much to get it. By the time dragon is dead, and they're taking a fight where it's. Almost a three v four with Yankos not having smite and being at two hundred HP. Okay, but uh, I, I don't know that. Ah, no, no way. The 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 dragon's worth like four thousand gold. Not at that point, but it will be by twenty minutes. You have to get to that point, but the more gold you get yeah, the sure. team early, the harder and harder it becomes to get to that point. Yeah. Okay. Oh, by the way, you were away when we started discussing this, LS, but what yeah. do you think about the whole angle that, like, for example, obviously they first picked the bot lane a lot of time. Like, they put the resources in some ways into perks, even though, like, I will acknowledge, by the way, I think it was a bad mistake anyway, because it's the AD carry, like, it's going to be hard to fucking get that going. What did you think about that aspect of the series? Getting LS. perks going? Yeah, what do you think about them? Like, it seems like they themselves thought perks was the way to win the series, right? Uh, Perks was on Ezreal in game three, which I, I think is actually a champion that has a lot of control inside of that game. I, I feel like it's Ezreal and Vygar versus the world. Um, and that one, the, the Yasuo Gragas, I mean, I'm not personally a very big fan um, of the way that they, they drafted in game number two. Um, Yasuo Gragas, I mean, it, it, it's one of those lanes where people can just willingly pick it or play it into anything, but I mean, it, it, it is a pretty strong champion that if it does get going it can obviously be oppressive so i don't know how i feel i mean i just don't like their their whole draft in game number two i think it's i think complete. game two is their worst draft yeah, yeah. also um, in, in like the game three thing where it's uh, what is the ls is saying the onus is on ezreal and the vagar i think that's terrible no position. it's on fpx or the, what if it, it's up to g2 to play well on the vagar and the ezreal like if i look at the course of the year and i look at yeah. like cap champions perk champions Ezreal and Vagar are not the ones that stick out to me. It's actually the reverse. I think perks on Ezreal is something that sticks out to me as like a negative. So even in that draft, like I feel like something like that I would point to G2 is like these are not champions you normally play. These are not champions you're practiced on. Like if it's um who is it? <sighs> Nemesis Vagar, Teddy Ezreal, like that's something maybe I would yeah. depend on. But for G2, I think that's also playing away from what they're good at. Oh, I mean, we we I I don't know how much practice they've put into Vigar and Ezreal. I, I I would imagine they have more practice on Vigar and Ezreal than they might have on say Kiana, right? In the last week or something that you want them to dedicate time to. If, uh, yeah, I mean, Ezreal, I, Ezreal's been a, a champion for so long too. I also, ignoring it's, the fact that they obviously got three zero, so a lot of other, like, yeah. uh, in theory, in th you'd think anything different might give them a different chance, but that's not necessarily the case. Like, it's possible you could have like picked the right drafts, you just didn't execute them as we discussed. Like, if yeah. you could go back in time and all you tell G two is this, right? Forget any of the weird plans you've picked. Just go into draft and just try and get the strongest champions you can. Just go and get power picks. Would they win? Would they have a better chance in this series? Would G two have a better chance? Yes. I think if they pick scaling every game, yeah. Because from my perspective, chance. like, this was a great example of, like, this actually reminds me of when I criticized Cloud9 drafts. It's like, I can see what you were trying to do, but you actually outfought yourself. Like, it's only yourself you tricked on some of these ones. Like, like you're doing stuff where, like like we said earlier, with someone like, like, oh, but I could flex this. It's like, the other team doesn't care if you flex yeah. that particular champion. Like that, that just, That's not always a positive, you know. Like, FPX is getting yeah. their comp. FPX is getting their picks out all the time. Like, they're, In fact, that's actually the reason why I thought G2 would directly attack FPX in the draft, because FPX isn't a team that just drafts the power picks. Like, they draft specifically for what they want to do in the game. So, in theory, you can try and cut those guys off. But, they did, but as you saw from the bands, they didn't want to give up power. Yeah. Um, I, I think that G2 throughout the tournament, I mean, I, I commented on this already, that when G2 didn't have the scaling, they lost. Uh, lost Griffin. Um, they, they did beat Dom1. Uh, so I guess, I guess that would be the outlier. They did beat Dom1. 
but the way that they beat Dom Juan was very shaky, especially the game that they got so far ahead, and it came down to that one last team fight. Um, after all the leads that they secured, the way that they beat SKT was with scaling. I feel like the best chance that they had to win the series was obviously in game number three. They were so far ahead uh, at 20 minutes, and even when FPX got the Baron, uh, the first Baron, they were still in a winning position at 25, and then at 29... Um, they ended up just giving up another Baron because I, I believe Wonder was getting blue buff and Ezreal was far away and they had no blue trinket, so they had one available, but somehow FPX are able to get to the Baron and just simply burst it and then a team fight transpires for no reason. But I th <laughs> think it was pretty clear that Game 3 was their closest chance to win the entire series and also simultaneously their worst early game that they experienced throughout the entire series. So I think that that's saying something. I, th I think if they drafted uh, scaling and just responded to FPX's drafts at every stage, especially because they had red pit, they had red side twice, right? They have it. Uh, they have red side they have it, three. Yeah, they had it on one and three. So I mean, th th those are going to be the two strongest ways to neutralize or, or suffocate FPX's draft because you just have so much power on red side with the way that, especially with the way FPX drafts, they don't they don't draft scaling. By the way, this Crisp guy in the final as well was just fucking unreal as well. What a, what a sick player this guy is. Yeah, both he and an absolute and monster. I, I think, yeah, I think he's their best player. Like so many times. like the, 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 That was a perfect example of a final where I feel bad for people because like, like this is the worst part about that series is the reason it also doesn't feel competitive is because like all year long, one thing everyone's loved watching from G2 is like skirmishes that become extended team fights that like they fight, they make the right decision on or they know when to push forwards, etc. Every single time it felt like I was about to get a real 5v5 in this series, it would start like the first two people would start fighting and then it would just be three G2 players running away. Mm -hmm. It was sort of, like I actually even thought in the actual matches, they themselves like they weren't G2. I think... Going on to your Chris point and why the fights look so bad, like this guy engages so well and he draws enough aggro. His stopwatch use is amazing. His flash use is amazing. He's just incredibly mechanically clean on support in a way where he's like maximizing his role with small skirmishes. Well, it's also the picks he set up, sets up too, right? The way that he moves on the map in order to... And then he hits, like you're saying, mechanically, like he's like hitting all these thresh hooks, but he's also there at the right time. His timing's really good. It's very impressive, I think. Yeah. I, th I think just overall, I think as a team, Doin B makes it so easy for the jungle and support to do the things they need to do. You yeah. say that, but nothing Doin B does makes a fucking hook come out super sick or a flash <laughs> flare. Like, like Doin B doesn't do any of that. But I know what you mean. Like Doin B, he sets Doin the B gives up. the yes. ball to yes. Chris, and Chris has sure. to shoot it, and he has to get yes. it in the net. But Doin B passes the ball better to Chris. Than Agreed. Anybody does. Yeah, sure. What do you actually think overall, Ellis, of Gim Goon? Because I know I think you actually had him um, on your top twenty list for Worlds, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Um, I think he's a player that. Uh, well, I, I think he actually did really well. Yeah, he did. He did very poorly. Uh, his, his gangplank, which his gangplank is actually one of his premier champions, but. In the, the FPX series versus G2 in the finals, too, his gangplank was so bad. He, he looked like he was playing on ping with how much CS he was missing and the way that he was just casting spells. Um, so it definitely looked really off. Um, I don't think Gimgoon is... I, I feel like he, he's the most undervalued on the team, but I, I also think that uh, Crisp is the best player on their team. And then after that... Uh, it's probably Gim Goon or LWX. I actually have Tian at the lowest, uh, below doing B. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think the finals he, he played really bad. Do you think that was nerves? I mean, he's been around for a really yeah, long no time, but he's rare. Yeah. Like, he obviously hasn't been ever on a, a stage this big. Yeah, I, I I don't know what it could have possibly been, like um. I'm sure some people would wonder, like, maybe is his poor performance or something uh, due to the matchups that he was in. And obviously, Gangplank Rise is a nightmare. Um, there was the, there was what? There was the, the Kled uh, versus Akali as well. Um, but Wonder was just outclassing him in every game. I, I think a lot of people will look at the game where Wonder gets uh, just annihilated in the early phases of the game. 
but just the way that they're both conducting themselves, Wonder was doing a lot better. Well, I, I think Wonder isn't... was set up to do a lot better. Yeah, yeah I think G two really emphasized Wonder's matchup in the top lane. Do you yeah. think that top lane wasn't as relevant at this tournament? Because if you think about a lot of the teams with the strong top laners, they didn't do particularly well. Getting, no, not getting Dovith really important and diving top is really important. Top is a very important role, but I don't think it becomes like, oh man, this guy outlaned this guy so much. I mean, it did happen in the Griffin IG theory, or not IG, um, or yeah, Griffin IG yeah, theory, just where like the shy like just ripped sword a new one. But most of the time, it's like top lane is a benefactor of things going on in mid and jungle. And then, then top lane starts mattering a lot. Because if you have the stronger split pusher, that matters. But top laner itself doesn't have a lot of control earlier on, unless the skill difference is huge. Yep. The sad thing but, is, obviously, like with this particular five-man G2 line, like they had that amazing stat, you know, where they'd never lost a best of five until this point in time. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the problem is, I can't even think of any best of five, even the ones where they got pushed to five games, where that were anything like this. Because this is the first time I ever saw G2 look completely muted. Like, as I said, it's hard for me to even just put the blame only on them individually. Like, I don't feel like yeah, Jankos and Mickey X were even in a position to do anything. Like, all the shit that made them my like, MVP candidates, they were, the game was never at the position where they could have done any of that. Like, Jankos from minute one of some of these games was fucking getting his shit pushed in. Mickey X just did not. By the way, this entire Worlds was whack as fuck for Mickey X. Where was Mickey X at Worlds? This guy was one of the best players in the entire world like three months ago, like an absurdly good player. At this tournament, all I saw him do was, first of all, pick champions he's not even good on. And then even when he got his champions, like the hook champions, he'd fuck all with them. It was mad depressing. G2 would lose game one. They would adapt. They get a good temperature of what the enemy team wants to do. They get a good read on like, okay, this is what they're good at. This is how we can neutralize it. These are stuff we're better at. They have tools in all five lanes. They're able to... Just adapt to what the enemy team is good at. Take away core picks. That G2 just was not there. They're not able to take away Kiana. They're not able to neutralize what Doin B and Tian wants to do in mid and jungle. Like G2 is a good best of five team because they play well under pressure. They play well there when they're behind. They adapt the best. And they just didn't have all those elements that made them so good in best of five. It, it felt like watching another team. It, it did not watch feel like watching G2 play a best of five. All the I put it this way. Right. There. This is a good example, actually. I'll use this as a perfect example to highlight how people don't understand what the Darde Award is. So, for example, yes, based on how he played at Worlds, I think Jankos was way under the level most people thought he would be at because, obviously, he was the MVP of LEC Summer. But here's the thing. No one, just because he was the MVP, didn't people didn't really say, like, first of all, Jankos is not an unknown qual quantity. And then secondly, people weren't like, he will be the best jungler. Like, actually, people wondered, why would he match up? Like, I think a lot of people like myself gave TM the match up. So, personally, I don't think Jankos, just because he was bad, earns like the Dardia. He, he didn't have the hype to make that appropriate, actually. Like, you, basically, it would have had to, he'd have had to have had the type of Tarzan and then had the performance of Jankos now to earn the Dardia Award, in my opinion. Oh, and I already won the Dardia Award, check credit. Why, why did you win the Dada Award? Fucking Reddit said so. <laughs> okay. We've already discussed how Reddit can't actually get that award out. So, oh, sorry. Well, my right. favorite thing, Monty, but this is the favorite, totally unintentional comment that Reddit people made that I loved. So I, I held it deeply inside because what was great about it was it showed they didn't know what the Dada Award was, even at the very end, was when people were like, Besides what? You think you invented the Dardy Award? Just saying who was overrated? Never what the Dardy Award meant. Never from second one what the Dardy Award meant. <laughs> Not least because think about it, you dumb motherfucker. Why would the phrase Dardy Award become more famous and ubiquitous than the phrase most overrated? <laughs> a term and concept that already exists. Doesn't make sense. You don't make sense. Get the fuck out. Right. So that's the end of that part. So that, that, that ends the Dardy Award shot because there was no Dardy Award. Let's real. Like, I don't think anyone actually deserves it overall here. Like as much as I want to hear on local, I can't say Perk deserves it. He was good in the rest of the tournament, wasn't he? Yes, like, very pretty good. fucking good. So mm -hmm. I don't think anyone does for that one. Right. What about what else in this final? Was there anyone who actually played well from G2 within concept? I guess one I mean, the whole thing, like, like I, the whole thing that yeah. I think we're nitpicking about, honestly, and I think why we spent so much time on the draft is that the games themselves were so there was nothing in the game exactly disappointing that it's almost like you know, I it's like everything went wrong from the, the start of it. So it's really hard to even discuss the games because they were so shit. So usually like there's two major win conditions. Of course, there's other ones, but like the two biggest ones are, are you stronger in a team fight or do you have the stronger split pusher? Like 10 minutes into the game, neither were true for G2 a lot of times. 
So I feel like yeah, but here's mm-hmm. all right. Here's the question I want to ask everyone. Then is this like the one part that does actually? I think okay. Here's what I think we're missing: is most of this year the actual discussions in league have been like this. Like it's no longer a case where it's just about the strength of the team overall. It's no longer about like late game macro decisions as much as like early and mid game stuff. About it's about fighting. It's about individual strength. The team with the best individual players typically wins a lot of these series. Wins their regions. Most of the teams winning the regions except LPL basically with the super teams. Look mm-hmm. at fucking the teams from all these other team liquid G two uh, SKT. Beyond IG winning spring, FPX is a team where, like, what's crazy is all five players, I mean, I know now we would rank people like Crisp and Tian highly, but we didn't know coming into Worlds. All five players on paper would have been ranked as worse than the G2 players or worse than the top Asian players, for example, aside from themselves. So, like, the crazy thing about FPX is they've won Worlds in dominant fashion now with, like, an underwhelming squad of players. So does that not mean at the end of the year it actually turned out that some kind of, like, strategical components overrode every element of individual skill? Strategical component, very important, yes. And also overlapping with the meta strengths. I think those were really big for FPX. But like you said, like, once we kind of opened the jar, like, Tian and Chris were no pushovers, and Doimbi is a very unique player. And LWX, like, even though he had a miserable group stage, like is pretty good too. So I don't think it's very. Are my point his, though? Like he did his like, dude, He did his job. He did his job. Put it this way: this is the part that's crazy, local. Imagine mm-hmm. me telling you three years ago, yeah, a Chinese team wins worlds. Oh, don't worry, all of their laners are like fairly average to even, maybe even below average, but they win worlds anyway. Like that would seem insane. Like if you imagine saying, best oh, for jungle support." I'd be like, "What?" That's yeah, exactly. Where, that's where I would be. Surprised. Like that's that's what to me makes this a new world that the F- FPX team can win. I mean, this is like un- unprecedented. Yeah, I mean, it shows like the state of the game. Like, it, jungle support are fucking important roles. Like, these roles carry so much control and they sway the game so much. And by the way, as much as I was loving the G2 storyline and I thought it would have been amazing for like a Western team to be the first team to ever do the G- Grand Slam, as much as I love all that, by the way, one thing I'll never hate on is greatness. And so I actually think, listen, as much as that ruined everyone's narrative in the West, the storyline for Doinby winning is fucking amazing. This is like if I won Worlds and yeah, still wasn't yeah. the best mid laner. Like, <laughs> that's unbelievable. That's actually one of the sickest storylines ever. I, I mean, know it came last just, second. because we He's were just like attention. grinding out his weird place <laughs> It's amazing, isn't it? And then suddenly, and everyone was telling him he's wrong. Of yeah, course. everybody was telling him he was wrong. <laughs> didn't even, you know, the Scion didn't even have to come out in the finals, even though it's not like it was banned, right? And I think that's what's so crazy about these drafts is realizing that Dolan B still had another, like, another pick he could have gone to, in spite of the fact that he played three different picks, right? That he's known for already. So, because here's the thing, right? As much as if you're gimmicky and cheesy, you banner one or two things and then you don't have anything. And then you really truly are gimmicky or cheesy. That's my point. Yeah. The point I was going to make is this low core is listen, you can definitely say like, this guy's not Chovy and lane. Yes. This guy's not like the greatest team fighting mid in the world, but like he knows his own strengths so much. It is absurd because as we're talking, pointing out here, like it's not even like you can fuck this guy in the draft. This is ridiculous. I, I, let, I, let me, let me put it this way. This guy's been playing like this for so long and I used to hate, I used to hate watching him play like back on like the Chow Goo Reapers day because I thought he was a gimmick. And I think over time, his dedication to play like refining his own strengths has been really remarkable. And I think he I mean, absolutely. Now he's proved everybody wrong. He's figured out multiple different ways to play this style to a degree that he can't be banned out to a degree that you are forced to adapt to him. I think it's very impressive. There's an element. I'm not going to say luck, but fortunate circumstance to it. If Worlds was played on the patch where Azir Corky is de facto the best two mid laners, then sure. I don't think Doinby and I don't think FPX. No, no, I think that's perfectly the logical. Yeah, there are fortunate circumstances that helped FTX win and that helped Doinby be so affected. Yeah, agreed. That's one thing, by the way, that I'll always say is unfortunate. Is like people will always just assume whoever will like. Sadly, that narrative will never kill it, by the way. Like, the narrative will always go like this. The team that won Worlds is the one that adapted the most. They didn't know. Look at this one here, you dumb fucks. <laughs> FPX made everyone else adapt to him. No one could, and they won the championship. Like, it's actually the opposite of that whack narrative, isn't it? Like, they didn't in any way, did they? And meanwhile, as Loco's saying, if the better is just the same as before, Doinby could have sat there all night long praying to God, Buddha, Jesus, like every fucking deity that ever existed. He wouldn't have won the finals, would he? He wouldn't even been in the final. Let's be real. You know, I'm not hitting. <laughs> What's your outlook on Korea after Worlds? Because like for some people, okay. yeah, Korea. For some people, Korea is over. Like, what's your outlook on Korea? Um. So I think. Well, I mean, I think Korea still individually has 
uh, the most elite players. Whoa, I don't know what that just was. Something just dropped. Um, I think Korea still has the most individually uh, strong players, like overall as well. Um, I will like, also point out, by the way, again, just to be a dick, Gim Goon yeah. and Doinby yeah. are Korean. Like, again, like everyone oh. was saying, like, yeah. another victory for the LPL. Yeah. No, but I'm, fuck it. RNG would yeah. have been a victory for the LPL. Yeah. This, I, is I, a, I, this is a half victory for Korea again. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm counting yeah. um, the rookie and shy and stuff as, as Chinese uh, for people that. Fair, same okay. with Doinby and uh, yeah, yeah. Gim Goon. Um, I'm, so I'm counting the Chinese. has the most elite players. Elite. Individually elite. As a region, yeah. Yeah, as, as a region. Um, so. I think the LCK, I harped on about it all year long on the cast, uh, even the finals and stuff. I would literally, I mean, there were so many threads that made front page where I would jokingly say, oh, of course they're going to pick this champion here because of how terrible it is, but the the irony of how, of course, they must think that this is a good champion. Um, and, it, I mean, that goes into the draft predictions during the live cast or whatever, uh, but... The, Korea, Korea is really weird. I mean, why did they why did they wait six months and for one Karthus nerf to eventually start playing him? Um, why did one person has to show it and everyone has to be like, oh, yeah, it's which, not is, a which is now a, it's good. Yeah, which is a fundamental problem. That's within a flawed the, approach. Within, yeah, it's, it's, a very, it's a very very flawed approach. Um, Korea will not learn from other regions. Korea and it will not. I admit other regions are better. Korea yeah. will not learn that. Oh, look, they played this. This can be good. They I, do this. Well, this I, I think I think what's, so, what's true is that if in a world where Fun Plus Phoenix is in Korea, I don't think they ever play that style. Uh, probably maybe not. Yeah, I don't think any but, coach in Korea is going to let you do any of that shit anywhere. <laughs> no, so the, the the whole thing about Korea and and the plague draft system and the fact that they have to basically wait for something to be broken it leads to very toxic practice and it leads to very ineffective practice um i, I mentioned in my vod reviews that i was doing on stream um as well as some of the commentary that i was doing uh with the live world co-streams and whatnot uh that a lot of korean rookies and amateurs and even some of the the players on teams they wanted g2 to win so that korea would change um because players mm -hmm. by themselves don't have enough authority just because oh. of the way that Korean culture and everything works. This is perfect um, analogy. So, so uh, everyone wanted G2 to win. Because Korea's knee-jerk reaction to failure is practice harder, more scrim blocks, more meta champions, and... Probably I mean, copy what I, they're doing, the people well, beat you. Yeah. Right, so I, I, I've talked about this uh, before in interviews and stuff, that Korean infrastructure internally, in terms of like staff, management, direction, and stuff, from my personal experience, because I, I was there on a Korean team as well as talking with uh, other players from within Korean teams and whatnot is very far behind NA and EU. Um, and that's a very scary thing, except for some of the very big LCK teams. So, so oh, really, or go ahead. If, if no one's changing the meta, if no one's saying, hey, this isn't good, why are we continuing to do this, et cetera, and they keep this mindset like that they've had for 20 years since StarCraft 1. If someone's better than you, copy them. And then if you can't do what they're doing, don't try to innovate. Don't try to don't try to do anything different. And I found it so funny casting the relegation matches this year because that was where the most diversity and actual change of pace actually occurred, was from the Challenger Series teams going up against the, the LCK teams. No and even, if you look how successful they were. Even, even in uh, Challengers Korea, it was the weirdest fucking thing in the world. I actually asked one of the other uh, coaches, I said, what, what is actually going on where every game you will four ban Malice, Evelyn, Karthus, Kled, and Kha'Zix or Graves or whatever. They, they would literally just four ban them. First three bans every single draft, uh, Evelyn, Karthus, and then one of his other junglers. Or they would ban Draven. And then they would go back to banning Malice. Karthus and Eve are not meta champions in Korea. How can this player have a 100% win rate on these bad champions and also apparently demand that you ban them every single fucking game and, and yet, yet you don't become power picks. Yeah. And they can, explain, the it, sense, really. they can explain it as this is cheese. We don't want to play versus cheese. But the analogy I want to give. Well, then like, look at the fucking game if you think it's cheese. Well, what's cheese about Karthus flame horizoning your jungler at 18 fucking minutes and being up three levels? Because this is not you just can't do anything. Legends. This is not what's supposed to happen. <sighs> so and that's, that's the mindset that Kree is in. That's why I think they're bad with Baron. Because I think they have a formula. When we get Baron, everyone lay down. Let us get three turrets. Let us farm. And people don't allow them to do that internationally. 
So the analogy I want to give is K-pop versus American music. In America, you have your own personality. You have like kind of what you want to do. And then you stay true to your vision as an artist and labels come and pick you up. And then the labels give you a bigger platform to be an artist. We're going to assume he means independent artists, say people. I know that he already failed by making America fucking home of capitalism, the part where you keep your integrity in artists. But we're going to say like as an independent artist, yeah, not as like, not as a pop artist, obviously, yes. In Korea, from a 14, from when you're like 14, 13, agencies will come and they'll pick you up and they have a certain idea on how they want the artist to look, how they want the artist. And they'll even make you get plastic surgery as locals alluding to, yeah. And they'll raise you in a way and they'll create you in a way and put you under a seven-year contract to be a certain K-pop star. And that's what Koreans, I, I, that's what Korea is in a lot of aspects. Like to get into an art college, instead of being creative, they give you like a vase, they give you fruits and they ask you to draw that fruit and the vase accurately as possible. Not to be creative, not to show what you think is art, and not to artistically create. Did you draw some like fine art. ass bitch with huge titties holding the, the apple <laughs> no, or whatever? I did the, just I did to the, show off your skills. No, I did the fruits <laughs> in the jar. I got into the second best college that way, but yeah, that is. Really <laughs> to be fair, I forgot we actually are on the Cloud Nights Twitch channel. When I said that. <laughs> whatever, keep going. I kept it vaguely within bounds. <laughs> Thorin's back is, to Discord. Thorin, unfortunately. <laughs> that is my analogy. That is like how Korea. <laughs> views a lot of things they have an ideal idea of how something should be and they ask people to fit into it where china europe and even an a to a certain degree like look at clutch they take the pieces they have and they give the power back to the players and allow the players to create what they think is ideal league of legends what is best for them like that aligns with their strengths by the way this is also one of the things i think actually sucks about the whole g2 scenario is like this really was like like there's a term that you have in sports your window to win like when when do you have your chance to win like you don't get many win, a, a large window in most sports like like obviously this core they've got them under contract they could absolutely they're going to play all i think they're going to contract the next two years maybe they could definitely play again next year and be very good but you never know if they're going to be the best team by the time worlds comes next year this actually was the chance and so sadly in line with what you were just saying their local that's mm -hmm. the other thing imagine what this would have done for league of legends that like this team nobody was picking grabs as coach of the split grabs himself wouldn't even have said i'm coach of the split like he knows his job on that team is like I've got all the best players and even better, they're like par partially self-directed. My job's like, get out of their way at the right time and then occasionally, you know, give my input and hopefully they take it on board. Like one of the things I loved about this G2 team was they were so self-directed. So like, it's not that that cancels it now. They didn't win Worlds. We're not going to have teams like that anymore. But I think that would have been a brilliant direction to head in in terms of League of Legends teams. I guess, I guess what's so disappointing for me about this is that I think a lot of people had G2 coming in as a favorite. And when when it happened, like last year, it was very clear that Fnatic was not going to win the championships. I don't think anybody sure. really thought. That. So it wasn't surprising when they got absolutely destroyed. I did predict them to win the final, but whatever. That was a lot of hope was involved in that. I can't lie. There <laughs> you was didn't a lot talk of hope. To Reckless back then, but Reckless said it was a shot. This was the chance. Uh, but anyway, I think most people Even thought better. IG was the was the favorite, right? Mm -hmm. So I think coming into this finals, where most people believed that G two was the honest to god favorite, and at least we expected a more competitive series for it to have exactly the same 3-0 result as last year. I think that's really what hurts because mm -hmm. it, it almost feels like even though G2 had a spectacular season and people shouldn't discount the MSI win that they had inevitably because they got smashed in the finals of worlds, like it's going to be discounted. Right. So it just feels, it just feels really bad to have this happen back to back year and for it to happen especially this year when it looked like there was a real shot. I think China winning is not that bad. I think Korea continuously winning and forcing the Korean playstyle would have been like the worst yep. case scenario possible. I think China is actually a lot closer to Europe than it is to Korea in terms of culture and playstyle. Korea is having Korea. a lot more power, being creative with what they do, playing to player strength. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I, I think I think Korea or I think China and Europe are a lot healthier for uh, progression overall in in league. Well, I think that's just true because as long as there's either an NA or an EU team as in a Western team, 
that's yeah. doing well, then it's good for the entirety of the West. And China is the biggest viewership region. So yeah, I think yeah, objectively, yeah. like these EU China finals are probably in the best. Like in terms of viewership, this is definitely like the best for Lee. Mm -hmm. The problem is this, right? Sure, like, I know obviously we can't know what circumstances will unfold in the future, but like this feels like the best chance you will ever get if you're a Western team to win Worlds. Like even if you think coming into this world, it's one of the only times I've ever seen it where actually I thought it was doubly ex likely at G2-1 because you looked at the best teams in LCK and LPL and there was no like obvious champion. Like, yeah, you could say SKT should be very strong. Dude. Yeah, they've got great players. They were yeah. LCK champions. Yeah, obviously IG has good players. Like half these teams are like, to me, there was no clear favorite from Korea. Like you can't expect that to happen three, four years in a row. Like next year, there might just be some God tier team and then you won't win. One thing better I, I said regarding European teams, and that's true for this year and last year, both um, Fnatic and G2 don't have imports. And the fact that they can show these kind of performances, make world finals. I mean, there's a black mark next to Fnatic's last year, but G2 is like, you can't argue. They destroyed three Korean teams to get here. Yeah, yeah. They lost to one. They lost to Griffin, but they show that... The, Put it this way, this is the most impressive runner-up fucking performance ever at Worlds. Like, this, that, it was going to be the perfect one, basically, if they won this final. For the next generation of European players, and hopefully for the NA players, like, let's group in the West, they know they don't have to copy Korea, they know they don't have to rely on imports, and they can't match up to the Eastern players. So I don't I, think it's the best shot gonna say, Alice? West is going to No, I think Europe is basically the West's only chance to, to win Worlds. I, I think when, when NA... Uh, I mean, NA, so in, in structurally, NA is a mess right now, right? Their, their solo queue is a joke. Mm -hmm. Um, they have, I mean, they're literally the California shore. I, I don't know if the Jersey shore rebranded, then I, I guess that's where it ends up going, but they're, they're doing stuff that doesn't make sense. I don't know if the in-house has stopped, right? They, they got the they're permission to stream the, the tournament realm, but I, I mean, I haven't heard as much about it as I would have hoped. To have heard about it after they were granted that permission to, to play on TR, maybe they're playing on it. Maybe maybe they're doing stuff. But then um, this isn't even private, right? Jacob Wolf tweeted this. I think ESPN uh, about the the Huni contract. Did everyone here see that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dude, that by is the way, a this guy is laugh. amazing. I, this guy really, is the I ultimate check stealer of all time. The ultimate check stealer of all time. It's unbelievable. Guaranteed they money. Can't Are the you contract. fucking kidding me? Three million guaranteed, and he had a guaranteed before. When, I, when I can't believe this is real. Decisions like, yeah, I can't believe it's real either. You have that kind of money to invest in in things, and it's this really is where much. you choose to allocate it. So I, I don't, I don't know. Is NA just becoming a a, a brand place? Do, uh, do, well, do you it know always was, to be that? fair. I mean, it always was, but is that? now just the accept no but i agree because here's the thing like the problem with that is that that sum of money i know nowadays people have heard stories about china and the money let's be absolutely real here the kind of money they're paying huni could have bought a really good korean right now like even if you just want to go with an import you could just get a sick korean you now could have probably got you don't have to get huni you could have gotten keen you could have by the way just for reference he means the top laner keen not the shit fucking mid laner from years ago <laughs> like obviously he's not talking about old gravity keen he means the the africa freaks yeah, top I, I promise you i promise you africa freaks can't pay keen the amount of money exactly he's got right made. Right, especially exactly. with US dollars worth so much more so it's even more in korean whatever whatever keen's getting on salary okay. so you could have gotten keen you could have gotten summit probably uh for that i mean what is what is actually, I mean, not even for that, Le less than that. You you could have gotten Summit or you could have gotten Keen. Interestingly enough, Summit was actually in NA in 2017 uh, to try out and teams passed on him. Okay. So obviously this is, uh, he goes to Africa, he trains. Local on probably saw him in, in trials and said, yeah, he's not like, so, yeah. holy shit. I mean, <laughs> th 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 this region, I mean, th the region is plagued by League of Cards. It's plagued by... Uh, I, I don't even know. What's League of Cards? I don't I, know about I mean, reference. It's like a what, political what show is that? people try to It's, it's a political show. Like, climb up the ladder. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you mean House of Cards? House of Cards. Yeah, but League of Cards. Because... <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. Right. Okay. I yeah, didn't hear that reference. Sorry. Oh, right. Things make a lot of sense. Either. Lots of things just get recycled. Actual problems aren't uh, called actual problems. People have very false ideas of what is actually plaguing teams. People are readily uh, using conjecture to reach conclusions on what is plaguing teams and all this other stuff. And there doesn't seem to be any incentive to actually do stuff that will up the whole of the region, or at least not yet. Okay. And so then I, I think what's so tilting about this Huni pick is like 
we he is like the ultimate known quantity. Like you know exactly what Huni is, right? And so it's it's a it's a paycheck that doesn't have a lot of meaning. Like for that level of value, it just seems super wacky. And for that level, I like I understand what their their thought process is. So for the, no, to put this in, let's, let's contextualize as a streamer. Let's let, yes, let's contextualize this though. So you we need to put ourselves into the shoes of these teams that are buying into the league again. So the rumors were what thirty million dollars coming from EG. 30, 40, yeah, yeah, yes. that was the rumor coming in. So if those slot, if the Echo Fox slot, let's say by by EG was purchased for thirty million dollars. The problem is then, because they're sort of in for a penny, in for a pound at that point in time, that in their brains, they're like, well, we just paid $30 million for this. Ergo, we should spend a lot of money to get the best possible team, which I will tell you right now, like I know a lot actually about what's going on in terms of free agency at this point in time. And the buyouts are absurd right mm -hmm. now for these players, especially like the salary is one thing. Uh, and that is absurd also in this case. But even for bad players, the buyouts have reached absolute fucking nutty highs. Because the problem is, is that once these teams buy in for that amount of money, they're not shy about, oh, Dignitas is like, well, we already spent $30 million. What's another $2 million, a $1 million a year on Huni, right? So I just think it's because like you're increasing, you're saying your budget is going to be maybe... 10 to 20 percent potentially of max 20 percent obviously like if you're going to pay like six million dollars or whatever um which would be very hard to do even if you are paying huni 1.15 million dollars a year so you're saying like oh well you know wh why not just pay 20 percent of our buy-in on top of that for a great team this first year and they're looking at huni and they're like this guy he speaks English. He's a brand. He can get us fans because they don't have a method to get fans if they hire a, a Korean player because it's a gamble that they're going to learn English, that they're going to synergize with the team, that they're going to perform. So why not just go with the known brand quantity? So it doesn't matter if you win or lose, you're still going to have fans. Because here's the thing. Go watch all those esports salons I did about the concept of franchising, about what specifically would happen in League of Legends when they franchise. And these owners are fucking liars. What they absolutely told all of us to convince us to give yeah. them franchising was that if we gave them franchising, this is exactly what they wouldn't do. They wouldn't overpay players who aren't good and recycle the same names just to have, as you say, some Twitter followers, some clout, yep. some fans, even if you shit. Well, they wouldn't do that. That's what we were told franchising would yes, work actively against and de-incentivize. And instead, what we would get was development of talent or the league itself would level up. In fact, I'd even say, by the way, Monty, what I alluded to before was all already implied. They never explicitly said that, but the implication was when you franchise the league, it would also actually then justify spending more money on import right if you want to get the absolute best player because your league would now have money making ability so you could to get some of it back so actually they just like the 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 premise they set off was completely yeah. false it turns well, out it, to be fair it's not all the owners that are doing that cloud nine sure. the rumors are cloud nine sold like half their team to eg right there's another problem i have monty so there's another thing i don't want to hear about right so you know what i know teams can't come out publicly and admit we're not trying to win but I'm so sick and tired. So there's another thing. Well, when you make franchising, I'll have monetization options so then we can all compete. No, you won't. Now the second and third best team in the league will min-max the whole time, not even attempt to go for the best possible team and just well, say, who gives a fuck? We're coming second while spending less. That's whack. Who the fuck would want a competitive league where the number two team doesn't try to win, just tries to say number two for as cheap as possible? That fucking sucks. I want to watch an actual competition. I don't want to watch Loki get paid a fucking like subsidy to grow corn every year in the plains at Worlds and G2 go, it's all right, I got licorice for four pence right. instead of 700 pounds for whom? Like, this is garbage. Okay. All right, all right. Will, to be, will, to be fair, while we are on the Cloud9 channel, we yeah. don't technically know what the signings are going to be all for right. C9. No. Okay. Right. Just replace sure. TSM with all that I just said there. Just <laughs> yeah. TSM. Well, so no, no, no. But, but, but we, don't, we don't know what the C9 signings sure, are. Sure, I don't okay. know their lineup. Right. So like, let's, let's, general let's, trend calm down. let's calm down on that one. Wait, let's calm down so on that one. For C9, one thing I will say is they will probably operate the same way, even if there is relegations. I think Jack feels comfortable enough with development and picking up young players and being able to get them to a good enough level 
where he would operate that way even with relegations because the amount of money people that's are offering possible. for buyouts is crazy, like Monty said. And that's just been the C9 way. I think right. C9... And, and, and mm-hmm. if these buyouts... Like, these buyouts are... When I say they're crazy, I mean, like, they're crazy, like Loco's saying. And so... I think that actually C9 is savvy enough to get a lot of value. I think they can just get more bang for their buck. Like they're going to they're going to sell these rubes, you know, a, a bunch of players and they're going to come back and actually make a decent investment. Yeah. The, also, I think that there's a lot to be said for sustainability in the space because the prop why why Huni's salary is so ridiculous is because it is clearly not sustainable. That like just in esports right now, in any esport, that is not a sustainable player salary. So, so <laughs> normally, when you pay someone a salary, like in any kind of field, they need to be able to bring you two to three times the value that you're paying them in salary. They, there's no way Huni can bring them two point three million in terms of value, and there's no way he can bring them multiples of that. So yes, it's not a sustainable way to operate. That's also the other part that kills me, like I alluded to before, is let's face it, this isn't like the Dignitas came along like idiots and just said, we'll give you millions of dollars. No, this was obviously a fucking bidding war. How is there a bidding war every year for Huni past 2016? Like well, you guys, we were not watching League before. The people, something like... the people making decisions to get players don't know what they're doing. That's true. I mean, you guys talked about this on a, on a previous uh, sure. Summoning Insight. So the people that are making these decisions have very false perceptions of these people simply because of a title. Title doesn't fucking explain anything to you. Title doesn't actually tell you if what the person's saying is accurate or credible. And because Riot invented this title in November 2014, or Riot invented the title with the coach stipend in January 2015, all of a sudden, Riot single-handedly created hundreds of jobs positions and hundreds of people that didn't exist before these dates. Then this bleeds out even further and people want even more staff. Suddenly people that didn't have job positions prior to these dates or these years before the stipends existed are now empowered with the ability to decide and decree where players are going to end up, where they're going to go, agents end up coming on board, and no one is saying if any of these people are right or not. And so because the titles are given power rather than the substance or the information, you have a lot of a fucking shit show. I mean, if you go to a hospital and there's a hundred different doctors inside of it and they all have the same degree, obviously there's one doctor out of those hundred is going to be the worst. He's not going to know what the fuck he's talking about, but he has a title. He has, sure. you know, he has his fucking, his title. You go on to the next doctor, the same fucking thing is going to occur. You Just because be, they have a title, it doesn't mean anything. You want to know what's funny? It's not even most coaches making the decisions. It's GMs or owners. And a of lot course of course that the don't GMs know anything have less knowledge. I would I would actually yes. feel way more comfortable if coaches were making roster decisions way more so. Oh, agreed. Yeah. Well, it's it's well, also that unfortunately it's in Riot's so best interest to keep this sort of ridiculous uh, you know, this merry-go-round of insane player salaries going because every time there's a leak like this, it looks good for Riot because they get to go out and say Oh wow! Look how much our players are getting. It looks paid. like sports. Yeah. It looks it looks like sports, but it's not reflective of the actual economy behind the system. No, no, it's, exactly. It's it's you know in many ways, I, you know, to put this out there, in many ways, it was really good for Riot for Echo Fox to fall apart. It was really good because then they got to sell this franchise, get somebody with a bunch of money who's willing to blow more money to pump it into the scene and so that they get leaks like this so that they look good for how much their players are making. It's actually incredible for Riot that Echo Fox died. I know it sounds crazy, but, it, you know... Oh, well, bad or died, what, what's the... What's by the, the way, I will also just say this. I will say one thing as well. I won't lose one second crying myself to sleep if NA, the region that only had money and laughed about having all the money for years when Europe had a fucking 50th of the money, doesn't have the money anymore to buy the players. <laughs> I won't cry myself to sleep at all over that, boys. Like, <laughs> you'll have to actually face your real well, reality then. So why why has no one thought about how you can have players that aren't playing in your academy or LCS team? You can have them on contract just to help. I mean, Korean teams, a lot of, a lot of players don't know this. Um, Afrika Chinese. has A, B, C, D, and I think E. And I think E's online. D can go to the facility. C can go to the facility. Or it might not be Afrika. It might be, it might be Gen G. Um, but anyways, they have these teams made up of challengers and grandmasters and master players, etc., that get practice, that do scrim, that Just are like having a practice team in okay. StarCraft. So, 
if you're going to spend 2.3 fucking million dollars, why not just say to an elite level player from another region, hey, you won't play in LCS or Academy or something, but you'll get a paycheck that is just as good. Come over, play as a third team, participate in scrims, and then whenever roster locks and swaps and stuff are going on, there's nothing to prevent us from just moving you to one of the main rosters for some sort of a match or, or something. Or trading him to a different team. Yeah. It, it doesn't make any fucking sense. That, that's infinitely cheaper than $2.3 million. Okay. You can so... literally have a, 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 a C team and a D team of elite level players that will take paychecks. I actually had an idea that was connected to this before, which was in the past. That was one of my suggestions to make solo queue better was you would literally bring out Koreans I gotta, I gotta come and play in solo Sorry. queue. Because my logic, remember, always goes like this with NA. The only thing I know that NA has is money and access to money. So I always tried to my money related fixes. So one of my solutions years ago was if I'm Steve, listen, mate, like going from like Jensen to fucking, let's say you could even get caps, isn't itself going to make you win worlds? Like you actually might be better off spending the extra money or whatever it costs you, just having a couple of these Korean super six solo queue players come over every three weeks and practice with your team playing solo queue, make solo queue better. If every top L LCS team did that, you'd have like, like we alluded to on, um, I guess we didn't, I can't remember what order we did this show, but we did an episode of the nines. Might be the one that hasn't come out yet where, oh no, we talked about on the one with West Rice, where basically that's what happened in Overwatch is when all the Overwatch League went to LA because yeah. all the players were there, it just instantly made their equivalent of solo queue amazing because yeah, it, was, it was just the top players in the world. Now you can't do that directly. You can't get all of Korea to come, but you need just to even get 10 Koreans 20 yeah. Koreans and throw them in the mix in Challenger. And they're, you know, one's on Cloud9, one's on TSM. Like you, it could be spread throughout the league as well. So the reason why they can't do it is the players aren't there the korean teams have gotten so much players under these like contracts and also there's like these academies popping up where they have a lot of these like solo queue talent look cool. this is killing me right now because what you're doing right now is what every cs go commentator does to me which is every single year for the past six years they come to me and go ah oh, i'm so jealous of you and your youtube channel wish i'd started one shame i didn't and then just walk away and then next year they come back and they say to me again I wish I'd started YouTube. I'd say, you know, if you just started last year, you'd be a year into it now. So the point I'm making here is local. <laughs> the premise you just explained started, is right. right today. You're right. You've got all the. I, don't, I would agree. I'm sure all the practice but partners have all been scouted yeah. out. Yeah, but the the point my <laughs> but my if you, opinion. If you start an academy here now, yeah. Yeah. you got to yeah, you got to go for the next years. And the idea is in the future. I think this even makes sense. In the future, let's face it. Is someone going to play for Gen G E team, or they're going to play for Team Liquid B team? It's yeah. way likely Team Liquid beats in that scenario, right? So, also, in, also the it's money, also a way to bust out. And also, the, we could also train better North American players by doing this too, because if you sign players from solo queue who may not be great, but if you at least put them in some sort of like training environment, we've talked about this before too. If you put them in a training environment, they will do better. It's basically what the Shy did. The Shy was just some cunt playing fucking Nidalee and what, what else was it on Riven on like Chinese solo queue for two years. And then they were like, unleash him into competitive play. And then he just started playing on like whatever team it was. The Shy, the Shy was signed well before he was 17. Yeah, right? yeah. That was the whole thing. Was That's a like good example of it. The ladder when he was too yeah. young to play. And then he was, yeah. China People forget that angle. That's possible. the angle no one brings up, is that China won Worlds the first time, essentially by secretly scouting the next faker of top lane and fucking signing him years in advance. Sure, it wasn't the same team. That's an exaggeration. But you know what I mean? Like, they essentially yeah. did. Uh, yeah. So yeah, in the yeah. future, it might be possible. But right now, like, Korea and China, like, holy, like, they... They are so down for Korean trainees. Yes, like, I will say them, a of lot of people, have, all of them. A lot of people don't understand. So, I mean, just look at just look at this world here. So, Gim Goon, fucking Doimbi. Right. These are all Korean let's, players. Let's move, away, let's move away. Let's move away from the Korean players. What was that last's point though? Did no, no, he, no, he never let's, got let's, a thought on this? Two teams. First off, yeah. two teams of fully European players have made the grand finals in back to back years. So why not do do it with European players? To be fair, capsules on both teams. Sure, that's that is that is a great point. But my but there are other good players, right? If the argument is sure. you can't get the Korean players, do it with the European players. Yeah, you can do it with Europeans. Your Europe has consistently raised more talent, and also, I mean, their solo queue is held in a higher regard in, in terms of quality. And historically, uh, I mean, I can't speak for games like CS:GO or something, Duncan. You would know more than me. In the beginning of every new game in StarCraft Two, it was the same way. North America was cheesier, more strategical, even invented some of the pioneer build orders. Europe was always mechanically better, and their ladder was always perceived as such. And then as time went on, Europeans tended to outnumber uh, North Americans and South Americans in terms of elite-level players. And LOL, we're seeing the same thing. I think 
there was a point where NA and EU solo queue was, the consensus was that it was relatively even. Now that's not the consensus anymore. By boot Haven't we even seen that players. based on all the people who came from America and tried to come yeah. play the US? Of Didn't course, they all of course. struggle to some degree? Uh, I mean, except for uh, some of them, but outliers help define the rule, not go against the notion True. that it's somehow the same. So uh, the same thing exists for Korean boot camps. You know, every, every single fucking time I talk about Korean solo queue, someone will tell to me about uh, Keith Mabrith uh, during Dynamic queue got really high on the ladder. Or the, you know, your, your favorite player, Froggen, uh, got high on the ladder. Um, and they'll, they'll mention these boot campers that got high. What they won't mention is the 60 that didn't. The yes. 60 that 200, 300 games deep are Diamond 2, Diamond 1. 50% win rate, riot accounts, or something. Um, you know, they'll tell me that I'm somehow lying about the 12 boot campers all living right near me and Goshi tells right now that are challenger from EU West to North America and struggling in Diamond 3, Diamond 2, Diamond 1, low master Korea. And some of them are higher than that. Doesn't fucking matter. They're the outliers. So when you have an entire ladder comprised of 4,000, 5,000 players at, at a certain MMR threshold or higher from China and Korea, because LPL players uh, will play here on VPN, you're talking about 5,000 outliers. The individual ability is so much higher. And that, that's ultimately what the latter test. So going back to the original thing, you could pull Europeans to North America and you could easily pay them more than they're going to get in national leagues or sure. the leagues just below it. And you can have them just train and practice. You can get them their visa so that they can live there. They're not in any official leagues. Fuck, they can stream. I mean, Americans love streaming. They love Twitter. So teach them social media. Teach them branding. Why are you dumping $2.3 million on one player? What, is, what are you doing? When he streams, how many viewers does he get? I don't know. What are his Twitter impressions? He has, 200, he has over 200,000 followers. What's the density, though? What is his actual outreach? How can they accurately measure? I mean, why the fuck are they not just signing Dr. Disrespect as, as somehow a streamer or something? He's going to have infinitely more minutes. Probably have more impact. <laughs> Well, also, yeah, also, more. you're signing players that can't even stream, right? Because in the season, you know, basically, you have to make a choice about sacrificing practice for streaming. So you're just well, well, I'm talking about the, the third and fourth. Well, no, 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 no. I, yes, I understand what you're saying. Like, yeah, you can you can practice six eight hours a day and then stream four or six, or you could you could stream the scrims. What's so bad about that? I mean, everything is out in the open nowadays. I don't think it's really no, I, a big problem. I, what I would do is I would I just take that two million dollars. I wouldn't pay it to Hooney. I would buy two million lottery tickets and just hope that I win more than two million dollars because that's about as stupid a plan as signing <laughs> Hooney to a fucking team for twenty twenty for millions of dollars. Now, to be fair, Hooney is going to be an NA resident next year. Uh, after in twenty at this point in time, mate, he may as well be American. That's how fucking bad he is at League of Legends. I'm sick of this guy. He should revoke his Korean citizenship. Was this guy ever from Korea? What's going on here? It's outrageous. No, the sad thing about him is as well. Like the I, to me, the killer for Huni is this: is I actually used to fuck with Huni quite a lot before SKT, but after I saw what he did in the SKT system and that he just could not change. He did very briefly early on, then he could not later. Yep. Like that just proved to me that he had a he plateaued as a player. Well, that's like, what I'm he's saying. He's a very out. known quantity. You know, the, the, like there's no uh, potential to go further. In in China right now, everyone knows that there's academies. Um, I don't think people know to what extent there is academies. I believe that there's a teenage player right now. I think he's 16 or 17. He tweeted on Twitter recently. He's a jungle player. Um, he's challenger on NA, but apparently he goes to JDG's academy in China. Mm -hmm. I also know um, a, a German uh, a German kid who reaches out to me a lot on Discord. He lives in one of the Chinese academies. There's also a French mid laner living in one of the Chinese academies. These are all players <laughs> under 18. Who the I fuck are these know. guys? Exactly. Like, so like, you just get China, there. And they're like fucking Dennis Hopper in the apocalypse. Now, what are I they doing in some Chinese I academy team? Some well, German they're, kid they're, like, hello, I am LS. So, I am trapped in an academy team. Like, what? Like, one of, um, one, one is this guy the, good or something? One of the parents uh, contacted me because uh, the, their kid wanted to go to a different academy. And the parent was skeptical about it because everything needed to do, be done with parental consent. And one of the parents actually contacted me. And uh, it was a German parent. Um, and he, he spoke pretty good English, but he was, he was very confused and perplexed why these Chinese academies were so interested in his 14 year old son. And like, why, why do they want to sign him to a contract? Why contracts? Like what the fuck is going on here? But obviously I think China is probably much more open to actually having Westerners in the future. Um, th they've done this now, I think in Starcraft too. I think they have some Western, uh, Starcraft uh, two pros. I also know okay. they have some Western Warcraft three players. 
Also, um, um, in Overwatch, some of the Chinese teams have Western players as okay, well. So, and they will literally I, be like living right, in China next. Right, right. So I assume that that's what's going on. So I think that people don't know about this. I mean, if you're Diamond 3 on Korea or higher, sometimes you'll randomly get ads by uh, people speaking to you with a translator asking, how old are you? And if you're young enough, they'll say, would you be interested in coming to this academy or you know, playing here? I'm so-and-so of a coach. Also, the academies then, are, are proliferating in Korea too. There are a lot of them that either exist yes, right now or yes, that are being yes. started soon. They're being Right. I, I know of two that actually just started within the last year. See, the sad thing is when you reach diamond on the Korean solo queue ladder, sometimes you get messages and you're like, oh, it's typical fucking, it's just one of those, no, uh, it's one of those also, spam emails, isn't it? It's like, hello, I am the son of a rich man in China. I wish to recruit you to my academy. Like, it's another one of those fucking like Saudi princes in it. Like, cancel that, close that. There's no way that's real. Like, turns out it's real the whole way. It just actually is a thing. I, I, but also Korea, Korea and China is also somewhat uh, a bit backwards, I think, on their logic. I think I, I tweeted out about a 25 year old mid laner. Uh, that had completed military in every single season because he did uh, gongik. Is, is that it, Loco, in Korean? Yeah, gongik. Gongik. Um, is um, where you like, go to the office instead of go to the army. Yeah, you work nine to five, and then you come home, you sleep at your house, and you have... It's basically uh, what a friend of ours did where he was in, like, it's like being in yeah. the civil services. Man, so, yeah, civil services, that's actually the correct right. term, yeah. So your, your, <coughs> your leader, whatever, sergeant, I, I, don't, I don't know, uh, the, the, the rank or whatever, he would call you at, like, 9 p.m., ask you what you're doing, call you at 11 p.m., make sure that you're still at home and whatnot, and then he'd call you in the morning or something. Um, sort of like you're on house arrest. But anyways... Um, this player maintained extremely high challenger, mid lane player, um, and I tweeted about him a couple of months ago because he tried out for teams, and I spoke to two of the players that participated in the same role. They both said to me, he's way better than both of us, we can't win against him, but the team told him he's too old. Even though we finished military and all this other shit, it's fucking nonsense. Remember there was I another uh, the ideal trainee they have and the ideal player they want. Yeah, like it's fucking the, absurd. He, he didn't fit the framework. That's why they don't take him. Dude, I know it's so it's so insane though. But that's because these people are in positions of power, with control that doesn't make any sense. And you ask where where did they come from? To to have this or to have the wherewithal to make these decisions. And we saw that in Griffin. That was like a huge one, right? Cho versus CV Max. Cho. Was a old director, old head coach. Starcraft, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and uh, I, I've seen it. Over CB Max. I've seen it so much, and it, it's very, it's very, very. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't want to get uh, actually in trouble. Uh, obviously, I, I, I can't comment too much. Um, but it is concerning. It, it's very, very concerning. There was a, there was a twenty year old uh, high MMR Korean challenger player. He got added um, by one of the one of the Korean teams. And uh, they asked him a series of questions about playing pro and all this other stuff, said that, you know, his stats were really good and gameplay was really good. And then, then the question came, how old are you? He said 20. And they said, oh, okay, never mind. What the fuck? Hmm. Makes no sense. Hmm. Uh, it makes me angry. Ah, uh, Jesus. Oh, by the way, one thing that actually generally, I'll just throw this out there, is actually does tilt me about any discussion about the West is, um, I, just, just for future reference, I'm never ever going to tolerate any discussion anymore about like gradual improvement that involves multiple years in and single teams, as though that's a real thing in League of Legends. Like There is no such thing in League of Legends as a real team who go to Worlds and go quarters, and then they change one player, or they just improve, and then next year they go semis, and then they improve, and then they go next, they don't. What happens is, as FPX showed you, you just make a team, and if it's the best, you win worlds. There's no build-up time. There's no start time. G2, there's no years well, together. Kind of. It's not like having an NFL team. You don't play together for five years and get to know the system. You just, you just, if you're the best, you win. Like so, this whole notion people still try to do in the West of like gradual. No, like Fnatic, if they had a good enough team, would have won worlds. They didn't, therefore they came top here. That's it. Like so, that whole angle. I feel like that's an area that unfortunately orgs just use as an excuse not to make like the big moves now. Which is like, you just settle on players that aren't good enough. Which is why it's even more perplexing that you would offer players multi-year guaranteed contracts. Crazy, isn't it? Like it, really, it's not the amount. But, I mean, it is the amount. I'll be real. It is also the amount, but the the worst part is the guaranteed. That's the worst part for me. Especially because, by the way, I know this is going to sound crazy because it's essentially speaking against player interests. And God knows we all have to worship players and give everything up in, in terms of pro players. We can't have any money in the industry, right? But one of the things that sucks is League of Legends as a sport, even more than the NFL, almost 
demands fucking non-guaranteed money. Because what if I sign the guy who's the best top player in the world now, the game becomes top lane means nothing and you only play fucking like like Malphite or something ridiculous there or Maokai like the old days and that's just the next three years. I've just wasted $10 million on that guy. The like, thing Monty said regarding like guaranteed contract and why it's ridiculous is like, you know, for it to happen, Monty, there has to be multiple people. Of course. Yeah, that means, that's yes, so the logic thing. the logic is loco. No one could say, I don't want to give you a guaranteed contract because the other guy is. It's a bidding yeah. war. So yeah. it, got, it got so ridiculous where people are like, I'll pay you. They're like, just giving him anything, yeah. Well, I'll pay you two mil. No, I'll pay you 2.3 mil. I'll pay you 2.3 mil plus guaranteed. They just kept one upping each other. And, I mean, good and for him. That's like, ridiculousness. Good, good for oh, him. Oh, it is good for him. This movie, yeah, it is. This money, it is. But like, I just, I just don't even understand what kind of wacky world we're living in where that makes any kind of... Right, to fix League of Legends, all I need is this, guys. I just needed to crowdfund $5 million because what I'll do is this. I'll take that $5 million and next Worlds, all I'll do is I'll just push every NA offer up by a bidding war, but I'll never be the one who actually pays. I'll just be the guy who pushes the bidding war up. I'll do it to all the teams. I'll make them all piss all their resources away, and after that, they'll have to learn. But I need five million dollars to do it because I have to actually have the money to do the bid. Like basically, I just want to be the dick who gets in that bidding room, like two hundred, four fifty, and at the end, I just pull out like seven million dollars. And the guy's like, "Why did I pay seven million dollars?" Like, That's why. So I'm already, just going to accelerate this process. It is already. We have to accelerate, it yeah. it we have already to accelerate you know, that one team. There's going to be no Winston in 2015. Duncan. Look, as long as yeah, basically, <laughs> as long as the teams continue to but without the obnoxious uh, parables and moralizing. Okay. <laughs> Without the uh, without free. <laughs> without the without the actual cycling of teams, this will stop. Again, the problem is is that EG and Dignitas were unleashed upon this scene. I think if that doesn't happen, then the insanity is not happening right now either. Jack right? is so happy these teams came in. Yeah, oh, EG yeah. came in. You need players. I got some. Yeah, great exactly. NBA players. Exactly. How about a summer MVP? Exactly. And Jack and, has been one of the very few people. Well, like, I was using him anywhere. <laughs> I was so, what? It's true. He wasn't. Exactly. He, wasn't. he goes, look, <laughs> barely even used at Worlds. Still in mint condition. One careful driver. <laughs> I think C9. In fact, this guy never plays all the Worlds games. <laughs> C9 is, yeah. the, is the team that actually has generated new NA talent like Licorice and Zazel, right? So, if anything, Jack is just loving the free money well, he's getting out of this. I mean, he's playing everybody else. You know, what's what's really sad is I, NA, I don't think, actually looks for talent. I think that they're very quick to brush things off. I also think that because the branding and social media, marketing, streaming, etc. is so important, that players that could be good but have a toxic reputation publicly and the way that uh, everyone is so vindictive as they are with dragging <coughs> through everyone through the mud, I mean, that's obviously really bad. NA has had very talented players that are, are well, I want to say that they're lost, uh, basically. I, I talked about this on my stream, maybe it was two weeks ago. Um, I mean, maybe you guys will disagree with this. I think that one of NA's lost players, in the sense that he won't play, play pro anymore, it, it's, uh, well, Moon, Moon was one of them. Um, Boxbox what? was actually one of them. No, what, I, I, I genuinely it's, think it's Boxbox. Fine. For the it's same fine. reasons that I say, for the same reasons I say Khan, Gwipo, Alfari, Crown, etc. I feel like good. he's, I think, I think that he's very mechanically good and fluid in the moment. In the same way that I would, I would champion those players before anyone said, I mean, there was a player actually recently, uh, April, uh, I made the tweet. I tweeted about Morgan. Bunch of coaches, analysts, pro players chimed in. I said, this is Korea's next top talent. Uh, he's a 17-year-old uh, top laner, never played competitively. His ID is Morgan. He had a 49% win rate on ladder because the early season was really fucked. He had extremely poor KDAs. He had gray numbers on everything. Everyone starts saying to me, he looks boosted. He has 49% win rate. What the fuck's he doing? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm just sitting there like, what the fuck does this have to do with this gameplay, you fucking idiots? <laughs> like, but it made me so mad because my whole fucking mentions are these people in titled positions telling me that this, this kid's not good because his stats don't make sense or his OPGG is bad. What the fuck? I, I remember getting into the argument about Crown at Worlds when I said he's the best mechanical player at Worlds and people asked me to define what are mechanics. Well, me mechanics are a lot of things. There there's a lot of minutia that goes into explaining mechanics or, or details that isn't just your reflexes or your reaction time. It's an overall awareness of many things that come together. It it's an understanding of what alternatives uh, exist, what limits you can push, what you can actually get away with, execute upon it consistently, what ranges you can balance, all these other things that... If you're not playing or you don't understand what the alternatives are, you can't even tell if the player is making a good or a bad decision. 
Mm. Which is that that that's baseline number one. But it, enough it, about how all the analysts in the league no, looked at Roxa for last year. There's a fucking problem with this because Morgan <laughs> ended up going to LPL. Yeah, he ended up playing uh, LPL. There's a bunch of other players like this that they just don't get looked at. They didn't like, get picked I, up. Of course not. Mm. Was this earlier this year? Did you say? Or was it right now? Absolutely, it was earlier this year. Well, Morgan did get picked up. Oh, right. he's, in, okay. he's in an LPL team now. But the, the problem is, is why is the knee-jerk reaction to say that his stats and his OPGG is bad and his history on his account is bad? Why don't you go into the game with a pro player and ask them to look at it? Doesn't make any sense. Apparently, that's too much work. Hmm. Oh, one thing that I, I mean, I've brought this up every discussion ever about any is like one of the first things I would do is implement scouts. Like that's the most, that's the most obvious first thing, isn't it? Hmm. Yes. Do we have any closing topic? Is there anything we need to hit before we wind down now? Um, I a new fourth release regarding Tony joining 100 Thief and T TSM letting go of Tony. Do you want to hit on that? By the way, I'll just say this. To Tony Top? You know no, what's funny? Six. No, no, Zix, oh, oh, okay. the former TSM guy. What's What tilts me about the 100 Thieves branding is this. So everyone praises their branding, right? They think it's amazing. The name's great. The, the name is shit. Because I just said it wrong there. None of you corrected me. It's not 100 Thieves. It's 100 Thieves. It's not A100 Thieves. It's not 100 Thieves. It's 100 Thieves, even though they shortened the name to the number 100 and Thieves. So if I read it, 100 Thieves, I would not be saying the name of their team. It's garbage. It's one of the worst mark. One of the worst. Luckily, we're not on the 100 Thieves channel, so I can keep going this one. It's one of the worst branding efforts I've ever seen. And then what was the thing that made all of you guys fall in love with this team before they even won anything? that they wore some old 1930s style fucking but I might just leave this show right now. Should we just end on that note? Like, I can't handle you people. <laughs> this is all about about the end. <laughs> they were wearing a fucking 1920s bed. And you were like, oh my God, that's so sick. You wouldn't, if someone came out in the club wearing that 1920s, like, oh, Babe Ruth fucking outfit, you'd be going, oh shit, you popping boy. No, you wouldn't. You'd be like, what the fuck's this old man doing here? Why is fucking Lou Gehrig alive in the club? Like, you guys think this is cool? There's nothing cool about him. Anyway, that's enough for that, right? Whatever. So anyway, right, we're back. We're back. Sorry, I've I can't down now. That's it. That's Triggered me the other day when I noticed it because whatever, it just got <laughs> so anyway. What's going on with 100 Thieves? 100 Thieves, sorry, 100 Thieves. My mistake, 100 Thieves. A sentence that would never make sense because it have to be A or 100 or 1. It never makes sense to say 100 Thieves. Why would I say that? So, like, now sentences work anyway. Keep going. They picked up Tony as head coach, <laughs> yes, as head coach for their League of Legends team. And one thing Tony <laughs> said in the his very first interview and his very first content piece was how there wasn't a lot of alignment on TSM. And with Papa, he feels like there's a lot more alignment in terms of vision, how he views what a competitive team should look like, how they should train players. And okay. yeah, he's looking forward to working with Papa for a long term. So I actually love Tony as a pickup. And I was quite disappointed by how the general community and even other teams felt about Prolly. I think a lot of 100 Thief problem was meshing up the rosters and it wasn't just probably fault and i'm not sure how involved he was in terms of roster building but yeah like really glad for tony but kind of sad for how much blame um probably is kind of taking in I, i'll say this based on what i'd heard probably was actually fairly involved with picking the players and stuff like as far as i know that is actually something he was involved with. i believe he even said it when he came on this show but mm -hmm. i will say this like the main problem that tilts me about the 100 Thieves situation is a lot of the behind-the-scenes problem they have weren't as bad as they actually were le le uh, where, where we were allowed to think they were because they made the classic mistake of just leaving a vacuum of no information. And into that, we all projected our theories and we all came up with angles. And as usual, the problem we always have is, as outsiders is we're usually going to look at something in the game, like, oh, look, Cody Sun players just part of that. But like... As far as I can tell, the, the actual problems they had were things that they just did a terrible job messaging to the public. So I know they've now like half tanked their rep. Like a lot of people gave up on a lot of their players, but some of that I actually think was just unfortunately organizational. I would say naivety. Like I think they should have been a lot. They should have been ahead of every story instead of way behind it. You know. Mm -hmm. I actually don't think Zix is a bad pickup for it though. I've always thought he's a good coach. I will say I do just find it absolutely hilarious that like right before he joined TSM, he said that quote like oh, it's fucking a cancer work there. Leaves one year later immediately after anyone who knows the situation what happened in that summer split when absolute clusterfuck that is. Like I, I think you were right then, Zix. Believe it or not. Well done. Mm -hmm.
I, I think uh, in, in regards to the 100 Thieves moves and stuff, uh, like always, uh, I say on your shows, in regards to coaches, um, I only measure stuff by people that enter in and out of their orbit and what they say over prolonged periods of time. Because without right. actually being inside of the team, you can't know what is going on. I will say that 100 sure. Thieves, um, th I mean, when, when intent is absent inside of play, or when when poor intent is visible uh, with with inside of play over an extended period of time, with no clear attempt to change it, almost regardless, I think that that's a a variable that could be looked at over a prolonged period of time. But beyond that, I don't know. I will have to wait until they announce players and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, having worked with Zix in the past, I think he's really smart about the game. I think he is one of the better North American coaches. Uh, obviously Papa decided that this is where he wanted to go, but I don't think it's, he sort of, you know, he stayed on CLG for a long time, obviously, but there was a reason why TSM pursued him, especially with this, you know, the people talking about the prestige of the TSM brand. And I think we can agree that given CLG's current state, that TSM was probably a career upgrade for him, at least on paper uh, last season. And it seems like, you know, there's a lot of weird stuff that happened on TSM last season, so it's not surprising that he leaves. But it, I think it is telling that this would be one of the, you know, the one of the people that Papa Smithy would go after right at the start of his tenure as GM on on 100 Thieves. Um, clearly, he's done his research. Obviously, he knows intimately the scene, so I think he's probably pretty capable of judging who is a good coach. And also there's obviously a reason me, he, he let go of Prowley, right? So. Sure. Also, yeah. it also suggests to me, by the way, that Papa Smithy wants to be very involved with setting the culture and all the rest of it, because that's one thing, actually, I've always personally thought was a knock against Zix. It's like he's not really like the authoritarian figure in that regard. You know, he's not the guy who's going to like lay the law down. In fact, as you've seen in a bunch of his teams, it can mean that when there's internal problems, they just kind of bubble under the surface. So to me, his job is going to be just coach and hopefully the rest of it's going to be top down from Papa Smithy, I would hope. I have it? to wait for more. End? I think that's it. Goodbye. Wow. Thank you, C9, for hosting the Nine Summoning Insight presented by AT&T. Perhaps we'll see you again. Glad we got this extra episode in. Thanks, Ellis, for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me.